Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Rancho Mirage City Council meeting. Uh, it is uh, Thursday, November 6th, and this is the Library Board, Housing Authority Board, Community Services District, and the City Council representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency, and this is our regular meeting. So the first thing we will be doing is our flag salute, and our City Clerk, Cindy, is going to be leading us in that. Okay, Cindy, would you please call roll? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hobart? Here. Councilmember Kite? Here. Councilmember Townsend? Here. Councilmember Weil? Here. And Mayor Smuckert? Here. Well, we very ha we have a very busy schedule today and lots of good stuff happening. And we have a couple of presentations. So we will start the first presentation. Uh, it is my pleasure. Um, to have uh, our Emergency Preparedness Commission come down and present the American Red Cross Award for Excellence in Disaster Preparedness presented to the Race to Be Ready of Rancho Mirage. And coming down here is uh, Marcia Stein, who is the chairperson of the Emergency Preparedness Commission, and Dr. Paul Coxton. Good afternoon, oh. Mayor Smothridge <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, and City Council. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Paul. Um, so let's just talk about the race to be ready. It was give, it's, being given, it's been given to the city of Rancho Mirage, and we were selected by the Red Cross for this most innovative and educational event for three counties. So they actually recognized our race to be ready for Riverside County, San Bernardino County, and Orange County. It's fabulous. I mean, really, that is such an incredible honor, considering it was the very first year we've done this. And um, we actually made money as well. But it was a fabulous event, and I'm so pleased that it was recognized as such a significant event for people to really learn about what it means to be prepared in a disaster. Um, many of you were there. The only problem was the wind is Rancho Mirage High School. This year it'll be at Rancho Mirage Library, thanks to the generosity of David Bryant and the city of Rancho Mirage. And that's a perfect venue. We're also including not only the race to be ready, and Dr. Paul will talk about that, but we're also including um, the, the forum. <laughs> it's gonna be on the same day, so we'll have speakers inside and we'll have everything going on outside. So I'm gonna let Dr. Paul talk for a minute and then we'll do a presentation to our mayor. Hello, good afternoon, mayor, staff, other council members, especially Charlie Townsend, who really came to our rescue uh, when we weren't quite prepared enough to get the race to be ready off the ground. He came through and gave us that uh, SOS life preserver and uh, really helped set us on our way, where we definitely have a creative recognition uh, around not only this uh, valley, but now throughout Southern California. We have even been contacted by other cities who want to duplicate what we've created. So Mayor Smotrich, thank you for bringing this concept to our forefront and giving us the opportunity, my wife and I, to be able to come up with an event that could marry the idea of being fit to be able to, to walk one mile or 5K, and for the more important aspect of being prepared in this valley with heat and all the elements that we have here, not to mention the biggest fault that's in California, we now have started to save lives. And that's what's really empowering, is that we have already had some successful cases. We have now distributed 25,000 children in this valley with our competition to become artists for the race to be ready for our t-shirts or for our finishing awards. So 
the trickle up effect from the children to their parents and to their grandparents is working. And without your support and the staff of the city, everybody, it really has taken a village to make this event you know, get off the ground. And we did end up uh, racing uh, right to the forefront. And so thank you again for this uh, terrific opportunity. This year we will marry, or 2015, we will marry the forum with the race and expo, bringing in the opportunity to have lectures, classes, inside and outside, teaching people about the elementary aspects of survival, including first aid, CPR, fire extinguisher usage, employment, storage. We will have the 8.0 earthquake trailer, again, the smoke trailer, showing people not only how to you know, get out of a structure fire, but how to prevent one. And the course, uh, as this year, we'll, it will be manned and woman by all the emergency responders that do participate in any type of a natural and or man-made event. And that includes the CERT people, which this city is incredibly behind, citizens emergency response teams, the green vested people that always are one of the first responders. We'll have the RACES people, the ham radio operators, the only form of communication you know, in an emergency when there's no power. So these type of people will be bringing together that'll be on our course, making the people feel comfortable and knowing that these are people who are gonna help them, especially for the children, help, helping them to understand that being prepared can be easy and it can be fun. And that's what the theme of our event is and why we know that with the help of the city, we'll continue to have an event that will continue to have this valley better prepared and will continue to save more lives. So thank you very much, Mayor. We would like to present you with this award that we received from the American Red Cross for excellence in disaster preparedness. So thank you for putting Rancho Mirage into the place that it needs to be, especially with this important event. So thanks again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. We will put it in our showcase and we will display it proudly. It was a lot of hard work uh, that went into receiving that and it's much appreciated. Thank You're you both. Thank you. thank you. Moving on to uh, another award. Um, this is presented to Captain Kevin Vest of the Riverside County Sheriff's Department. And he is coming down in front and I will meet him down there to present a proclamation. And this is, I have to tell you, with very mixed feelings because as much as I, we all want him to be successful in his new career, we certainly are, are troubled with the idea of having him move on to uh, another area and, and it's going to be our loss. So I'll be right down there. <clears throat> well, here we are. And I have a few words just to uh, um, say in, in uh, your honor. And to let, let everyone know some of your accomplishments, certainly not all or even a great part of them. But this is a proclamation honoring Captain Kevin Vest, whereas Kevin Vest joined the Riverside County Sheriff's Department after serving five years in the United States Marine Corps and began his career at the Southwest Detention Center in 1994. And whereas on October 12, 1995, Kevin was transferred to patrol at the Palm Desert Sheriff's Station and on January 31st, 1997, was assigned to the first motor officer position for the city of Rancho Mirage. And whereas, on December 28, 2000, he was promoted to the rank of sergeant and assigned to Indio Station, then to the San Jacinto Station. And whereas, Kevin Vess was promoted to the rank of lieutenant in October of 2005 and was awarded the Medal of Merit in 2009 for developing a database program to streamline police reporting, and whereas Kevin Vest was promoted to the rank of captain in November of 2011 
and became the station commander for the Palm Desert Station, where he <coughs> serves as chief of police for Palm Desert, Rancho Mirage, and Indian Wells. On April 4, 2012, Captain Vest was awarded Manager of the Year for the Riverside County Sheriff's Department in April of 2012, and whereas on November 12, 2014, Captain Kevin Vest will be promoted to the rank of Chief Deputy and will be leaving the Palm Desert Station to head the Sheriff's Central District Patrol Bureaus. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Iris M. Smotridge, Mayor of the City of Rancho Mirage, on behalf of the entire City Council, do hereby honor and extend our sincere appreciation to Captain Kevin Vest for his dedication to the Sheriff's Department and the City of Rancho Mirage. We wish him the best in all of his future endeavors. We certainly do. And I will let you say a few words, if you will. Mayor, Council, uh, all I can say is thank you very much. It's been uh, wonderful to be back. Uh, I can't believe three years has flown by so quickly. But, sorry, I don't do well at this, but I really, uh, coming back to the desert reminded me how much I really enjoyed working out here and all the people meeting faces that I worked with before. So it's been great. Thank you. Thank you. And how about if we, wherever you would like. All right, and I guess my, uh, one of my last official things that I'll do for you is I get the pleasure of introducing uh, the new commander of the Palm Desert Sheriff Station, uh, Captain Sue Trevino. Uh, a little bit about her is uh, she is a 27-year veteran of the department, God. and this is her, just like myself, this will be her, uh, whereas I only had two previous, this is my second time at Palm Desert, this is Sue's uh, third time at Palm Desert Station, and she's obviously very familiar with Ranch Mirage, and uh, she, I think she'll do great for you. So. Captain Sue Trevino. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, members of council. Um, I am so excited to be back in the Coachella Valley. As uh, Chief Vest said, uh, I have almost 28 years of experience and um, 21 of the, those years were in the Coachella Valley. So then they made me leave and go to the West End and I'm like, hey, can you please send me back to the East End? And, and I, I am so happy to be back and uh, this is my third tour of working Rancho Mirage, Indian Wells, and Palm Desert, so I'm very familiar with the area, and I am so happy for, to have the opportunity to work with you and serve this wonderful community. So thank you again. And thank you so much, Susan. Welcome to our city again, and uh, welcome to your new job. And moving to our next presentation, because it is with great honor that uh, Ted Weil is going to be presenting a proclamation to Maury Beschloss. And uh, Maury, if you come down in front, I think Ted is going to be meeting you there. Hello, everybody. <laughs> As you can tell, Maury is not bashful. Uh, this is really a great honor for me. Uh, we, are, we are presenting a proclamation to someone that I refer to as an institution in our city. Not belonging to an institution. <laughs> <laughs> he has been here, he has made a name, he has been a credit uh, to the uh, community, and we're just thrilled. To give you an idea of how admired and respected he is, uh, as many of you know, for years, uh, Maury and Steve Kelly, uh, who is on 1450 uh, radio, have had an annual sparring session, and which is much fun. Uh, they duel, 
and yet you can see the affection that they have for each other as well. And uh, it, it, it's a joy for all of us. Maury has many admirers and a great deal of respect from the community. Uh, we are so proud. We are so <coughs> proud that he lives in our city. He's a credit to Rancho Mirage. And Maury has a number of admired, admirers, uh, one of whom is David Bryant, who gets together with Maury regularly. And David, would you like to come up and say a few words? Thank you, Councilmember Weil. My dear friend, Maury Beschloss. Maury's story is really the American story of the early 20th century, now carrying into the early 21st century, which is not to give away your age at all. But Maury has oh, been... <laughs> no, no. But the remarkable thing about Maury is leaving Germany at age 10 in 1939, and by then, <clears throat> America was noticing, and certainly the German people were noticing, and certainly Jews were noticing. Hitler meant serious business. This was a terrifying time. Maury came to our country with his family. He used his intellect, his great study habits, his voracious reading, his quick learn of the English language, which I think is just remarkable. And he be he's become, as Ted said, an institution. But more than that, we read him in the Desert Sun. We look at his blog. He has a television show. And USA Today now has him as their featured economics writer. That's a remarkable feat, I think, coming from that background to this great country and being for every day, our story encapsulated in one great American. We love you, Maury. Not yet, Maury. Maury's ready to grab the mic. Uh, <laughs> I know you are. Uh, I believe that uh, another very good friend of yours uh, might like to say a few words. Dana, would you like to make a comment? Well, there's nothing more that can be said about Maury. Uh, wait a second, I didn't mean to phrase it that way, Maury. I meant to say, oops, uh, there's not enough time to say all the good things about you. But Maury and I have been close friends for about a dozen years. And, uh, uh, well, that's about. <laughs> and I've been corrected every time that I've been on the wrong side of, uh, of any fact. But there is nobody I know, literally nobody, regardless of age, who has the precise memory capability that Maury Beschloss has. And every time we get into an argument, if it ever centers on an era of time or a date, I back off because I know I'm wrong. Maury, been a wonderful friend, and you've been a wonderful attribute to the city of Rancho Mirage. Your column in the newspaper, and for those that don't know it, is now published in USA Today. Uh, after having a long string of years of being published at uh, the Desert uh, Sun. And uh, now he's writing for the world. And uh, it's, uh, it's just a real pleasure to be able to call you a native son, so to speak. Maury, what I'd like to do is I'd like to present you with this proclamation, and then obviously we would enjoy hearing you say a few things. But in the meantime, this proclamation is honoring Morris Beschloss. Morris, Maury Beschloss has lived in Rancho Mirage since 1982 and will celebrate 60 years of marriage to his wife, Ruth, on November 13th, 2014. <coughs> and Ruth is here. <laughs> Ruth, we're honored to have you as well. That's whereas the best Ma part of Maury. <laughs> <laughs> whereas Maury Beschloss was an original recipient of the Distinguished Eagle Scout Award bestowed to only 1% of eagles by the National Board of Boy Scouts of America to those who have distinguished themselves professionally for 25 years or more, and whereas <clears throat> Maury Beschloss has received a lifetime award as the plumbing, heating, cooling, piping industry's outstanding leader and was named to the Pipe Valve Fitting Industry Hall of Fame. He was also named to the Valve Industry's outstanding second half of 20th century personage. 
And whereas Maury Beshloff received the only distinguished alumni award in 80 years from the University of Illinois Communications College, the college also honored him by naming its Media Design Center the Beshloff Family Center in perpetuity. And Maury Beshloff is a World Affairs Council Director Emeritus, has received the California Governor, State <coughs> Senator, and Assembly Declaration of <coughs> Merits. And whereas Maury Beshloff was a Young Presidents Association International Board member and received the Military Officers Association Lifetime Membership Award, whereas Maury Beshloff published position with USA Today is designated as Beshloff Economics, and he is the sole online on ongoing USA Today economic analyst. And whereas the radio and TV audience of Maury Beshloff numbers at least 25,000, and USA Today website viewers wow. number in the hundreds of thousands. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Iris M. Smotrich, mayor of the city of Rancho Mirage, on behalf of the entire city council, do hereby honor <coughs> an extraordinary citizen of Rancho Mirage who brings value and respect to our wonderful community, Morris Beschloss. And it's my privilege and honor, Maury. Thanks, Ted. You know, I'm here with, this is family. This, is, this, is, this isn't like being in front of a group. Th these, th you're my family. I'm the luckiest guy that ever lived to spend his latter years, and by the way, I'm still looking forward to what I'm gonna do next, but uh, <laughs> at this stage in time, to be here in the finest city, in the Coachella Valley, in the Riverside County, in California, in the world, we are so lucky. All of us are so lucky to be here. And lo look at what this city has done just in the last 20 years. I, I don't have to tell you, but I, I feel pr privileged. Now, I promised my wife I wasn't going to say anything about her. But I'll tell you, the greatest thing that ever happened to me, that 60 years ago, on November 13th, in 1954, we were married. And half of what I've done, maybe even 75% of what I've accomplished would not have been possible without her. It, <laughs> also, she, in her own right, has been a contributor here to the City of Branch Mirage. Dana Hobart uh, nominated her, and she was adopted uh, by the whole council as a volunteer of the year, and she loves the city just as much as I do. So listen, I, uh, when you read about all the things that I've done, I said, gee, that guy must be somebody important. <laughs> Is it me? <laughs> and I really want to thank you, and I want to thank everybody for being my friends. I love the city, and I love you all, and I really, really respect this award more than anything else I've ever got. <coughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much, Ted, and thank you, Maury, for all the, the fine work you've done through the years, and the city would not be the same without you. Anyway, moving on to another introduction and uh, honoring a group of gentlemen from our Architectural Review Board, and Bud Kopp is going to be coming down there to um, introduce them, and here he's coming. Thank you. And while he's arriving here, let me just read a, a little bit of information about the Architectural Review Board. Uh, it was established in 1985, and it consists of eight members and meets the second and fourth Monday each month. 
the ARB members have education, experience, and interest in disciplines or, or trades related to building design, resort design, architecture, <coughs> landscape design, interior design, craftsmanship, environmental design, and much, much more. A minimum of two members must be licensed landscape architects, and three mem members must be architects. The ARB is responsible for reviewing site plans, architectural and landscape plans for projects in Rancho Mirage, ensuring the compatibility with neighboring property and development, <coughs> evaluating efficiency and safety of public access parking, upholding the appropriate amount of open space and use of water efficient landscaping, and ensuring consistency with adopted design guidelines and design review policies. The board provides the Planning Commission and City Council with valuable input on projects. So Bud Kopp, our Planning Manager, is staff liaison to the ARB, and I would like it for him to introduce our ARB members. Thank you, Mayor Smotrich. It's my pleasure to uh, uh, introduce the Architectural Review Board members. Uh, um, I see four of them in attendance today. Um, can you all please come down here to the front? We do have a uh, few members that were unable to be here today because of conflicting schedules, but uh, it's my pleasure to work with the, um, this group of dedicated individuals. I'd like to first introduce our chair of the Architectural Review Board, Ron Gregory, uh, here on the end. Um, Ron uh, has practiced landscape architecture in the desert uh, for about 35 years or so, since 1977. Uh, he, he has a firm called RGA Landscape Architects. Uh, his many years of experience have given him keen insight to water efficient landscaping and sustainable <coughs> landscape design. Uh, he has been on the city of Rancho Mirage Architectural Review Board for many years and is a graduate of UC Berkeley. Ron's married to Marcy and they have two children, Carly and Jeff. Um, next up here, we have uh, Tim Holt, and uh, let me get my cheat sheet here real quick. Tim's a 34-year resident of the city of Rancho Mirage, and uh, he's a licensed architect in California, Arizona, Hawaii, and Michigan. Uh, he's a senior principal of his architectural firm, which concentrates on public sector projects throughout Riverside, San Bernardino, and Imperial counties. Uh, Tim has been married to his wife, Jan, for 42 years and has two children who reside in Santa Monica. Um, we have Dennis uh, Freeman uh, here on the end, and uh, Dennis has been a desert developer since 1976. Uh, he is semi-retired, and uh, he's also a licensed general contractor, a real estate agent, and a mortgage lender. Dennis has been married for 38 years and has two male adult children, and he spent many years of community involvement with numerous desert organizations. Uh, we have uh, Bill. Bill Johnson, uh, he has been a principal with Holden and Johnson Architects for 35 years. He's a native Californian, and Bill's been a resident of the desert for 41 years. Uh, Bill and his wife, Gail, have two, two adult children, and he is happily a grandfather of two grandsons. And he enjoys hiking in Harleys. Uh, unfortunately, some of our talented individuals who serve the Architectural Review Board uh, couldn't be here today, so we thank them for their service. Uh, in addition to the four members we have here today, we have Al Albert Kelly, who's out of town. Uh, he attended the University of Washington with executive courses in business at Wharton and Kellogg. Uh, Al's career has primarily been in the hospitality industry, and he's, he was with Hyatt Corporation for 32 years and retired as vice president and COO. Uh, he was responsible for direction and oversight of hotels, destination resorts, spas, casinos, uh, a whole host of types of things. And for the ta uh, past 10 years, he's uh, had his own uh, consulting business here. Uh, we also have Ray Lopez, who's out of town today. Uh, he has a he's one of our landscape architects to uh, uh, accompany Ron Gregory on ARB. And uh, he has a, master's or a bachelor's degree in landscape architecture from Cal Poly uh, San Luis Obispo. 
Uh, Ray is the, he's a registered landscape architect and a principal of his own company. Uh, he's been on several architectural review boards throughout the valley and has worked on many park projects, landscape design guidelines, and uh, model home uh, complexes throughout the valley. Uh, we also have Dave Prest, who functions as our vice chair. Uh, Dave is principal with Prest Vuksik Architects here and has a bachelor's degree in architecture from the University of Arizona. He has been married uh, uh, to his wife, Micheline, and has three children. And uh, Dave was three-time all-conference baseball player in college, and he also played three seasons of minor league baseball with the San Francisco Giants organization. So, uh, and then uh, last but not least, we have uh, Charlie Martin. Uh, who uh, tends to function as the resident comedian of the group sometimes. Uh, he grew up in Bellingham, Washington, which he refers to as the Paris of the West. Uh, Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the University of Washington. He uh, did graduate work as an army ranger in Vietnam, and from there he transitioned into a mo uh, married model citizen in Seattle. Uh, he's designed and built residential, commercial, and including a 20-story medical office building called the Cabrini Hospital. Uh, Charlie moved to the desert in 1973. He practices with a one-man uh, office right now. And Charlie stated that he'll become a really good architect when he turns 80. Uh, that's his story, and he's sticking to it. So uh, members of the council and ladies and gentlemen, this is your Architectural Review Board. Thank you. Thank you so much, gentlemen, and a special thank you to Bud, Bud for putting all that together and how fortunate we are in our city to have such a talented group of uh, gentlemen helping to make some very important decisions for our city. Thank you again, and we wish you all the very best. Okay, moving on to uh, non-agenda. Oh, no, we have one more presentation, uh, and this is uh, going to be done. Um, and Richard is going to be handling this, and it's relating to the Bighorn Institute. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We do have one more. Yes. So I'm really pleased to introduce Jim DeForge and Amy Bayard from the Bighorn Institute. Over the years, the Institute and our city have worked closely to help protect the peninsula of Bighorn sheep in the mountains above the city. Jim DeForge did his undergraduate work and graduate work at Cal Poly, Pomona, and UC Davis. Jim has been working with the sheep since 1972 and has helped start the Bighorn Institute in 1982 to look into causes of the Bighorn sheep decline at that time. And he continues in his position as executive director. Amy has worked as a biologist for the Bighorn Institute for the past 14 years, and she received her wildlife biology degree from Kansas State University. The Bighorn obviously is very important to all of us here in Rancho Mirage. You can see behind us the Bighorn looking down on everything we do here. So at this time, Amy, I'd like to have you come forward and talk a little bit about uh, the current status of the Bighorn Sheep and the city's involvement with the Institute. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Councilman Kite. Thank you, Mayor and fellow council members and staff. Appreciate the opportunity to give you a brief update about uh, Bighorn Institute's work and the contract that you support us with. If you recall, in August of 2013, just last August, our barn burned down. Um, that barn is vital to our operations as it housed all the alfalfa for the captive herd. Uh, we came to you in October last year and asked, asked for some special funding of $5,000, and you graciously gave us that funding. This was our barn afterwards. With that funding, we were able to build this beautiful steel barn, and uh, it's, we're very pleased with that. It was completed in December, and it's fully stocked again with alfalfa. And the captive herd is important because we've released 126 sheep from our captive breeding program into the mountains around Rancho Mirage and Palm Springs. So it's helped keep two of the herds from disappearing. The uh, herd behind Rancho Mirage in the local mountains here is the northern Santa Rosa Mountains herd. That's one of our main study areas uh, that we're researching. 
The current population, there's about 75 adult bighorn uh, in your local mountains here, uh, which is pretty steady or slight increase from last year. 12 lambs survived in 2013, which is very good. We've actually had good lamb survivorship the past two years, um, which is necessary because the herd's getting older in your local mountains here, so that's very encouraging. We documented 24 lambs born this year in the Rancho Mirage area and are pleased that many are still alive. The bighorn proof fence or bighorn exclusion fence that the city uh, constructed uh, is another one of our responsibilities. We make sure we inspect that each month. Uh, it's been 12 years since the complete fence was built. Uh, phase one, if you recall, was done in 99, and then the rest of it was completed in 2002. It has completely eliminated all bighorn urban-related deaths in the Rancho Mirage area since its construction. It's been an incredible recovery tool. It has kept bighorn out of the urban area since 2003. We had a couple breaches in July of 2010 and 2012, but we found the sheep were getting in through Cathedral Canyon, through their fence, and we've been addressing that. We still inspect, as I mentioned, we still inspect that four and a half mile fence every month. We're out there hiking that to make sure there's no areas of concern where the sheep can get into the uh, urban areas of Rancho Mirage, and we take care of any gaps we can. This is an example of a couple of fence issues just this past June. This is what uh, we're looking for to avoid. We had uh, an open gate, which is an obvious concern where sheep could get right through. This is behind Thunderbird uh, Heights. And then we actually had someone cut the fence, that photo on the right. And that's a concern because uh, that's a preserve area you've set aside, so there aren't supposed to be people, there's someone with the dog <coughs> going through, and we also, of course, do not want the sheep coming through any gaps. And your staff is very responsive and gets things taken care of immediately. We help maintain eight man-made water sources in the northern Santa Rosas around Ranch Mirage, including the city's water source, the Ranch Mirage Sheep Preserve Water. This, uh, it's hard to tell, there's a, this is the fire access road adjacent to City Hall here, and that arrow is pointing to a broken pipe where water is just gushing out, and that pipe feeds your water source. And this is the Ranch and Mirage Sheep Preserve that's functioning beautifully and is receiving sheep use, and it's a vital uh, resource for the local sheep here. And we also help clean up vegetation, clear out invasive non-native vegetation around the water sources. This is called Bradley Spring, and this is behind Thunderbird Heights. This water source was put in, I believe, in the late 70s, and the immediate vegetation around that is fountain grass, and then there's arrowweed that can be as high as five feet tall. We'll go in and trim that because that vegetation can impede the sheep's vision and they can get ambushed by predators, so that's always a concern. In addition to this field work, we are also out doing public education and outreach. We did a talk in April at your Ranch Mirage Library. So um, those are some of the other things that we're doing with your funding. And we just very much appreciate your support and are very proud to work with such a conservation-minded city. <coughs> and I'm happy if you have any questions for me. I was wanted to keep it brief. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. So. It's always a pleasure having you here and to uh, hear all these wonderful updates and, and, and know that uh, the work that you're doing is so much appreciated and, and doing such fine preservation of these lovely animals. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Any comments from council? Well, I have one question, Amy. How, how do the bighorn sheep fight off predators such as the coyotes and some of the larger cats that are in the area? Well, they don't fight, they run. So they have to flee them. Um, occasionally though, a ram might chase off a coyote, a single coyote, but in general, bighorn sheep flee predators. So they'll, that's why they need that steep mountainous terrain to get up high and get in that uh, areas that the predators can't get to them. So. Do the, what about the uh, lambs? Uh, the lambs, they have to be taught right away also to run, to run and go to that steep terrain to where the bobcats and coyotes can't get to them as well. They're very adept on the mountains. They're incredible, and the predators typically can't <clears throat> keep up with them. But they can be ambushed in situations around water sources and things like that. Yeah. The, those are weak areas for them. Thank you. Amy, Thank you. are the uh, coyotes on the rise? They... We don't know for sure, but they are. there are more typically around the urban fringe or the urban areas because sometimes people feed them or they're attracted to where we leave pet food out and things like that. So certainly it might seem like they're on the rise because you might see them around the homes more than if you were hiking in the hills or something. Um, but I'm not sure that Cal Fish and Wildlife has a handle on their numbers or what the population is doing. They're certainly out there. Yes, they are. <laughs> okay. Thank you Thank very you. much for your time. Thank you again, Amy. Okay, moving.
moving on to non-agenda public comments. And this is a time for people who want the opportunity mm -hmm. to speak publicly on issues that are not on the agenda for a maximum of three minutes per speaker. So I do have a couple of yellow cards here. If you have had not had the opportunity to fill one out, you may come up and speak without filling out the yellow card. But we will call, first of all, <coughs> Chelsea Pancho. And uh, she is going to be speaking on Up With People in the Coachella Valley. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for giving me a couple of minutes, uh, even though you had to because I filled out the yellow card. My name is Chelsea Panshot, and I'm the U.S. Sales and Tour Manager for Up With People. We're a global education, community service, and performing arts program. We're bringing about 100 students from 20 different countries into the Coachella Valley in March of 2015, from the 16th to the 23rd. Uh, they're going to be spread out across the valley. They'll be living with local host families. So it's a great cross-cultural immersion and exchange opportunity for our cast, as well as families in the area. We'll be doing about 1,000 hours of community service across several different nonprofit organizations in the, uh, in the area. Uh, doing some work in the schools, we've talked with the Ophelia Project, meeting with Find Food Bank this afternoon, uh, and several other local nonprofit organizations. We'll be at roughly 10 to 15 sites uh, per day, and then doing a couple of uh, benefit concerts for local nonprofit organizations to help them raise funds and awareness for their programs. Uh, our cast represents about 20 different countries, and we're happy to share, come and share our cultures with the area. We haven't been back in this area for nearly 20 years. So we're very excited. One of our former board members lives uh, in Indian Wells, and so he's kind of spearheaded this project to get the cast back into town. We'll be celebrating our 50th anniversary, so this is one of only five tour stops in the United States. We'll be spending five weeks in Europe and then five weeks in Mexico. Uh, and the group is roughly 18 to 29 years old that's coming into this area and local youth will have an opportunity to apply to travel in future programs. The, they can earn 12 college credits for traveling with us for six months, uh, 24 college credits for traveling with us for a year. And so we'll be sure to get all of that information out through the schools. I've had an opportunity to meet with Palm Desert, Coachella, Indian Wells, and Cathedral City city managers and talk with them about the needs in their communities. Would love to do the same for you to see what the best way is that we can get out and get involved and give back. Uh, really, the purpose of our visits is to come in and do something to the community. We want to come in and do something with you. So it will be great to learn about the needs here and how we can best support those and hopefully get community members thinking about how they can get out, get involved, and give back as well. So we'd love to invite you to come and volunteer with us if you're interested. And of course, come and check out the performances uh, over the weekend that we're here. Are there any questions? Well, seeing no questions. Thank you so much, Chelsea. It's always a pleasure to hear about your organization. Is it all right if I do yeah. that? Sure. Why don't you just leave it with our city clerk there, and we, she will pass them out. Okay. Moving on to the next uh, person with a yellow card, Alan Worthy. And please remember to keep your comments to three minutes. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you for having me again, and thank you for allowing me to speak the last time. I was a tardy, if you recall, because I laid on the freeway. I'd like to speak in general of the egregious behavior uh, and upholding the rule of law. Uh, I'm a Christian scientist, and I'm proud of it. Uh, contrary to popular belief, we go to the doctor, as did Mrs. Annenberg. A genuine, uh, genuine Christian scientist loves Protestant, Jew, and Catholic, DD and MD, loves all who love God good, and he loves his enemies. It will be found that instead of opposing such an individual, such an individual subserves the interests of both medical faculty and Christianity, and they thrive together. With regard to obtrusive mental healing, Mrs. Eddy had this to say. The question will present itself, shall people be treated mentally without their knowledge or consent? The direct rule for practice of Christian science is the golden rule. As ye would do to men, should you do to you, do ye. Who of us would have our houses broken open or our locks picked? And much less would have our minds tampered with. 
The abuse which I call attention to is promiscuous and unannounced mental practice where there is no necessity for it. Or the, or the motive is mercenary. As a rule, one has no more right to enter the mind of a person, stir, upset, and adjust his thoughts without his knowledge or consent. And I'll end with her writings from Science and Health, where she writes, those who discern Christian science will uphold the hold crime in check. They will aid in the ejection of error. They will maintain law and order and cheerfully await the certainty of ultimate perfection. We have had far too much malfeasance and egregious behavior on the part of these three cities with regard to the crime that has happened to my family. And we are appalled, and there are no words to describe what we have been through and the losses that we have suffered because of it. And I would appreciate all of your kind prayer and support. Mrs. Annenberg would be appalled. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Worthy. Uh, Moving on to other comments from the audience, people that wish to speak. Uh, the first one is Roxanne Bauer. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, and staff. Um, my name is Roxanne Bauer. I'm a resident of Rancho Mirage, and I come to you today because recently the signal on Los Alamos, Gerald Ford, and Inverness Drive has been removed. There have been six accidents in two weeks. They're not small ones. There are people that are on the curb. Um, two days ago, when I was on my way to pavilions, I spoke with our citizens on patrol, and they just finished cleaning up their fourth one of the week. I asked that that light be put back, because I really feel that it's, there's going to be a fatal accident. Thank you for your time. Thank Any you questions? So much. Well, maybe no. maybe Bruce Harry could address the subject for you a little Please. bit. Please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what she's referring to is the protected left turn um, that mm -hmm. was uh, removed back on August 5th. Um, we've done that at about eight locations throughout the city. Um, um, I, I I did ask the sheriff's department to give me a, a, a history of the accidents out there because I, mm -hmm. I was aware of the two that just recently occurred on Tuesday. Um, as I mentioned, the, the signal was modified on the 5th. Um, there were two small accidents uh, on the 16th and 30th of August that were not reported. They were just an exchange of information between the drivers. They must have just maybe bumped each other or something. Uh, the first uh, accident that occurred with a broadside was on 927. Um, I'm getting the report from the Sheriff's Department on that. I have not seen that one yet. Uh, the second accident occurred on 1020. Um, it was also a broadside. It was. These are basically um, caused, the, the cause of the accident is a left turn violation. People are turning left and, and a through vehicle is hitting them. Uh, then on 1030, there was a, um, an accident, which I have not, the report's still not yet available. And then of course the two on Tuesday. So basically there's a total of one, two, three, four, five, five reported accidents and two information exchanges. Mm -hmm. So that'd be a total of seven that have occurred since August 16th. Um, so we're looking, we don't know the real causes of them. Right now, they were list, uh, given to me as the, from the Sheriff's Department as left turn violations. Um, so far, of the eight that we've had around town, they've worked pretty well. I had a lot of compliments on them, but this particular intersection, we probably need to look at and see if there's mm -hmm. some other issues there that we're not familiar with. We did go out and put up some additional signage, saw that. Yeah. which we had originally installed when we first made the change. It was up for a full 30 days. Um, and uh, now I think we're starting to see some um, of our seasonal residents coming back into town, visitors. I think we need to make them aware that there is a change. Uh, there's no longer the red green, red, green, yellow protected arrows. They're the green balls that you're supposed to yield on to oncoming traffic. So we got those signs out now. We're going to be looking at this intersection a little more closely. I will be taking this back to our Traffic Safety Commission, um, hopefully in a couple of weeks, okay. and we'll study that intersection. If I could... Just say one thing, if, sure. you, if you put yourself in that turn lane, where the picture was, and you put the, okay, a car is coming to turn into Mission Hills, you have to literally go into the intersection, past the other turning lane, 
to see if there's traffic. And by that point, it's too late. It's, it's, it's very dangerous. Yeah, I haven't seen the accidents yet. I'm not sure. I, I have seen three myself. I'm not sure what so, caused the accident, so I have to look I, at that. Um, if I it, know someone, the one that was, that was not yeah. reported, um, a woman, and she said it was just, you, sh you just can't see. It's, you know, <coughs> barely nipped her bumper. It was a small one that didn't go reported, but <coughs> it's just too hard to see there. So, so I, we'll look at it. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Bruce, Thank you. was there a reason that it was, they were taken down? Was it for traffic flow or why? Well, no, this is, this is the trend that's going on throughout the country, throughout California. Um, a lot of motorists are just tired of waiting at green arrows when there's nobody coming and they can make the left turn, which is how we all learned to drive. That's how I learned to drive. Uh, arrows didn't become popular until 20, 30 years ago. Um, but a lot of, uh, we, we, we got a lot of calls from residents. Why can't we put these protected, uh, these permissive left turns in? A lot of Palm Springs has them. Um, a lot of areas throughout the Southern California, you'll see them popping up. Uh, Cathedral City's done some. They're just trying to move traffic not have, having to wait for these uh, green arrows, but they don't work at all intersections. There's, we, we only have eight of them up. We have over 50 intersections in the city, and there are intersections that we won't put them at because mm -hmm. they don't belong there. Um, and uh, so we have a list that the Traffic Safety Commission, we studied for over 18 months. We went out and did site surveys, um, and we ins installed them. And this particular intersection seems to be having the most problem. We're not having this problem at any of the other intersections, so we're not really sure what's going on. If there is a site line problem, we'll look at that. Um, and maybe this is an intersection we may have to put the protected uh, left turns back in, but we'll have to study it more once I can see the accident reports and find out what the true um, right. uh, cause of the uh, yeah. collision was. Yeah, so it's just not Ranch Mirage that's removed them. It's kind of a ongoing, new way of doing traffic flow? Right, that's correct. Bruce, um, how long would you think it'll, it'll take to do a complete study on this? And do you think it might be worthwhile to go ahead and put the light back the way it was until we're able to finish this study and come back with some results? Yeah, putting the light back to where it was is not difficult to do. <coughs> it, it, it would, you know, we can do it in a day's time. Um, it's, uh, it would be putting the indications back up and reprogramming the controller, but it can be easily be done. Um, and uh, certainly if that's the council's desire to do so. Um, like I said, I haven't seen the accident report yet, so I don't know what the primary collision factor was, whether it was just somebody not paying attention or whether it was a line of sight issue. I don't know yet. So we wanted to wait till we got the report. The sheriff said they sh I should see a report here shortly. Um, now that they've taken the statements, they've uh, talked to the drivers, but the two that occurred on Thursday, on Tuesday, I'm sorry, this, the one that occurred in the later afternoon was more of a major injury. Uh, the one in the morning was minor, just some cuts and scrapes on one of the vehicle uh, motorists, but the one in the afternoon, I believe the woman uh, uh, that was broadsided did receive some major injuries, but nothing life-threatening, but um, I think it would be certainly worth, do that. Yeah, I think it would be worthwhile, at least while we're doing the study, to get this back. And obviously, there have been a lot of accidents there compared to the other locations. And uh, there's something unique about that light that's uh, creating this situation. <clears throat> May I comment? Yeah. Uh, could we have that photograph that uh, showed the oncoming lane? Uh, yeah, that one. Uh, <clears throat> I think the point, what is your name again? Roxanne Bauer. I, I think the point Ms. Bauer is making is particularly in the left-hand eastbound lane, a vehicle that is coming in that lane, say at 50 miles an hour, is moving, what, uh, 100 and, wait, what, how many feet per second? It's 88, 88, 88 feet, feet per, per second, second for 60 miles an hour. For 60, so, two seconds uh, carry them back 170 feet from the intersection. And I think reaction time is probably, depending on age and all that, but it's probably somewhere between one and two seconds, which almost... And even more for you and me. Yeah, and even more, as Richard said, <laughs> as Richard whispered in my ear, even more for <laughs> the two of us. Uh, and I am concerned that that lane is obscured significantly by, from ground level, by the uh, the trees and then the shrubbery that uh, 
uh, is depicted in the photograph. And I, I think that Richard's on the right track. I think we should probably get it back up, get it into operation, and uh, then see if there's any way to make that intersection more palatable for such a left turn uh, shorthand, so to speak, uh, than what we have at the present time. Because I don't, as I think of, this, uh, of the left turn situations throughout the city, I don't think of one that has quite the um, uh, obfuscation uh, elements that this one has as you look westerly. <clears throat> yeah, one thing about uh, Gerald Ford is the islands are six, 16, no, I'm sorry, they're 18 feet wide there. Those are our widest islands in the city. Most of our islands are 16 feet wide. Um, so there might be more of an island there, what you're looking down. We, we, we make sure there's at least four to 500 feet of line of sight. And as you look down that street, you can probably see about 800 feet down that street. But I understand what she's saying. If there's a car in the opposing left turn lane and you're trying to make a left, it's hard to see around that vehicle, especially if they haven't tried to make their turn yet mm -hmm. to open that up for you. So we'll look at that more closely okay. and we can certainly put the intersection back into protected mode. What, what, is, what is the view for a car that has been going eastbound wants to make a left turn <coughs> into Mission Hills? Is that, uh, that could also yes. be an obscured view because of what we have in the median. So it's probably a good idea to put it back in while our study sure. goes forward and then we can make final decision later. Yeah, well, I'll put the directive out to, we'll get it in as soon as we can. Hopefully uh, the next day or so it should be back okay. in. Thank you. Thank you all for your time. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Thank you so much, Ms. Bauer. All right, uh, next people in line, Paul and Linda Greiner. And they also wanted to make comments about traffic accidents. Uh, Your Honor, Councilman, um, I don't want to take your time because it was pretty much hashed out. <clears throat> the only thing I do want to tell State your I'm name. sorry. State your Paul, name and say. Paul Greiner, uh, Mission Hills in Oakmont. And my issue, and, and several others back here, is the same thing. The problem is the car that's making the left hand turn, either westbound or eastbound, is blocking the view of the driver on the opposite side. And the other biggest factor, and the only reason I came back up, is speed. Because it's 50 miles an hour, and no one's going 50, they're going 60 or 65. So, at, because it's difficult for patrolmen, they can't find any place there. There's no uh, place for them to park to observe traffic. <coughs> so because of that, speed on there is really strong. And, and, and uh, that makes it even more dangerous. But, but the main thing is being, bl it's a blind, left-hand turn line. And, and the, the guard, Angel Villa, he's witnessed uh, these accidents. He's the, he's the guard in charge, and he's at that Inverness gate. So he could also give you uh, additional information about those accidents, too. But so I don't take any more time. That's basically what, why we were here as well, about that same intersection and about the speed. Thank you so much for your comments. Richard, did you wish to say something? Yeah, Bruce, what is the speed limit on that street? Uh, the speed limit's 50, and as a matter of fact, I did talk to our um, Jimmy Johnson, our deputy, that he, I, I've seen him out there many times. He likes to hide out down by the Braille Institute and also in the other direction. And I asked him about the speed. He says the majority of the traffic drives at the speed limit. There are people that will drive upwards of 65 that he tickets. Those are the people. But the majority, he said about 85% of the traffic does drive at the speed limit. Um, we have this, this problem on a lot of our streets where we have that 15% that drive over the speed limit, and those are the people that we're uh, targeting to, to uh, issue citations. But he didn't think this was any unusual. This street's no more unusual than any other street in the city, but um, you will see people that could drive 60, 65 on that street at any given time. So, um, so that certainly is a concern. I think the biggest thing here is we need to look at this line of sight issue. This intersection may be one that needs to remain in the protected mode. And it's just one of those intersections that we can't use the permissive turning movement at. And like I said, these permissives don't work at every intersection and this just may be one of those that we're gonna have, we'll have to convert back and leave it that way. Yes, thank you. Um, the the Bruce, other thing is from that, uh, that intersection, uh, Los Alamos, from that light down to where the children's museum is, the guys use the light 
and they know they can get, run as fast as they want down there uh, without any policeman. He's rare, rare you ever see him there. So it'd be a great place to get some revenue for the city. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Greiner. Yeah, let me make a comment. Uh, Paul had um, uh, called me or, or we had chatted about this once before. Um, and consequently, as you recall, uh, we put in a speed meter uh, to essentially slow things down. And that lasts for a while, of course, and it does slow down. Uh, so, Bruce, conceivably we could do that a little more often, putting a, uh, you know, a, uh, a meter there of some kind, uh, one of the flashing, uh, uh, you know, meters, and it does slow the people down. You know, it, it frankly, it creates the impression that they're being clocked for excess speed, but it, uh, it is effective. We could do that, I think, in that area more often. It would slow, it would slow traffic. Okay. Uh, moving on to our last speaker, Linda Cole. And I believe Linda still also wants to talk about the dangerous intersection. Okay, would, I'm Linda would you Cole. state the city in which you live? Rancho Mirage. I use this exit that we were discussing um, just about every day. Uh, I won't repeat anything, but it is definitely a blind corner. If you were in that left turn lane and there's any car, I don't care if it's a short sports car, the larger the car, the worse the vision. You can absolutely not see by that car to see oncoming traffic for maybe a half mile to a mile behind it. And at 50 miles an hour, those cars come through very fast. So I don't care how careful a driver you are, if you can't see, you, you don't know if anyone's coming. Now at night, you can see lights, but during the day, you, you have no hope. Uh, you mentioned the accident this week, two of them. Uh, these are not uh, small accidents. The one that you said was no, um, no one was harmed, I happened to come by after the accident. There was a huge white panel van, tall, flipped. I mean, these are not minor accidents when you have cars turning over in that intersection. And so the, you know, it maybe helps traffic with that left turn signal, uh, but when you have two or three hours of the whole roadblock because of accidents, defeating the purpose. So I really am glad you're going to look into this because one day it's going to be a fatality if we don't do anything about it. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much for your comments. And as we all realize, we take this very seriously. There was a lot of studying done mm -hmm. before these were put into place, but we're going to explore further and certainly take <coughs> action as, as soon as possible with this one intersection. So thank you so much for all of you coming to, down to speak with us, and uh, we're listening to you. Thank you. Okay, no more city comments? Or no well, more public comments? Hand, she had her hand up a minute ago. Uh, is, is she with you? She's not with the, you. Huh? She's not speaking with she's you. With me. Is, yeah, she's with me. Okay, okay. All right, I think we'll close up public comments right now and move on to uh, city council comments. So, Dana, would you like to go first? Sure, I'd be more than glad to. I, as I was thinking about today, I was wondering how many uh, uh, bachelors we have uh, in Ranch Mirage who are essentially alone, and it occurred to me that uh, some of them might like to meet a lady named Kelsey. <laughs> and so this is the opportunity to not only meet Kelsey, but also Lynn Lockwood. <laughs> this is Kelsey. I remember Kelsey. She was here before. She has three great legs. Kelsey is our spokes dog today for the super pet adoption event that is happening here in Rancho Mirage. Um, she has a little beautiful spaniel face, and if you're a spaniel fan, you can always find these dogs available at adoption events. This event is November 15 and 16 at what we used to call Whitewater Park. Now it's the Rancho Mirage Park. If you come to adopt, we will have 40 animal welfare groups. We will have musicians, entertainers, dancers all day long. 
The event starts at 10 a.m., ends at 4 p.m. We will have approximately three to 400 animals up for adoption, <coughs> dogs and cats. They'll be coming from all over Southern California. My very sophisticated attire is to remind you we will be in Munchkin land. It is Wizard of Oz themed. There is no place like a home. So whether you're a spaniel lover or whether you want the little tiny guys, chihuahuas, we have a ton of shih tzus coming. Everyone loves that dog, very, very popular dog. Ton of those will be up for adoption. When you adopt, if you are a resident of the city of Rancho Mirage, you will have your adoption fee reimbursed. That's a huge deal. So you just bring in proof of adoption along with the county shelter information. You get your money back for that. So that's a really wonderful thing. We are very grateful to the city of Rancho Mirage for having supported us through the years with this event. It is amazing. If you don't want to adopt and you have a dog, $10 rabies shots, $10 microchips, the county will be there to issue licenses, and we will have, even have $10 name tags. So um, this is an incredible event. Bring your own dog, get the vaccines up to date, or come and adopt a new family member. We would love to have you there. Thank you, Lynn, and uh, as everybody can see, Kelsey would be a great addition to some lonely guy's life, so. Thanks. You guys do, you will let her go we to the right will, home. Yes, we will let all the adoptable dogs go. Sometimes we get a little teary-eyed, but they all need to find their forever home. That's what the goal is. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you at uh, Loving All Animals. <coughs> thank you, Dana, and thank you, Kelsey. All right, any other comments from the council? I Richard? do. Charlie. I do. Okay, have one. go right ahead. Thank you. I would like to invite everyone to attend this Saturday and Sunday, November 8th and 9th, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., Rancho Mirage's 14th annual Art Affair, taking place at the Rancho Mirage Community Park, featuring over 100 award winning visual artists with their art on display, a large food court and wine garden for your enjoyment live R&B, and smooth jazz music will be performed by five continuous bands, performing each day from 1 to 3. Southern California radio personality Fitz will be emceeing the entertainment event. It is free admission and free parking. For further information and directions, you can call the Rancho Mirage, City Hall at 760-324-4511, or visit online at RanchoMirageArtFair.com. Also at the park on Saturday, November the 8th, I have another one, we invite you to attend the new groundbreaking ceremony event for the new three-acre addition to that beautiful park. The three-acre expansion program through the existing park will take about nine months to complete and will include the new amphitheater which will seat over 600 people. Most of the park's existing amenities will remain, along with the addition of pickleboard courts. How many are those? Do we? Four. four of them, four pickleboard courts. They're also upgrading the play areas for children with new workout equipment and exercise stations, along with new pedestrian promenades. A grand new arrival, drop-off, and turnaround will also be built. We hope to see you at these wonderful events at Rancho Mirage. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. All right. Uh, Richard, no comment? Uh, just one brief comment, because I know Dana would want me to say something about this. But um, th for those of you who do support the Bighorn Institute, they are having a golf tournament coming up on the 24th of November at Stone Eagle. And then prior night, they're having a pre-party at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. So if you're interested in helping the Bighorn Institute and attending a great golf tournament and a pre-party, contact the uh, Institute, the Bighorn Institute in Palm Desert. Thank you. Thank you. And Ted, I believe you said no comment today. Okay, and I just have one qu quick comment and it's to advertise our fall book sale at our wonderful library. Uh, it's on 
Highway 111. I'm sure most of you know exactly where it is. It's in the community room, and they're having a wonderful book sale that they have every fall. It's Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, November 13, 14, and 15, uh, from 9 to 5 p.m. On Saturday, it'll be from 9 to 3 p.m. But this is a huge selection of gently used, almost new books in most cases and at wonderfully affordable prices. So the foundation book sale raises money for the library and it also promotes enthusiasm for reading. So put it on your calendar and we hope to see you there at the book sale at our library. Thank you and I think that's the end of our comments. So now we will be moving on to our minutes. And if there are no corrections or additions to the regular meeting of October 16th, 2014, I would like someone to make a motion. Move approval. And a second? Second. Okay. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. And moving on to our consent calendar. And Randy will be going through this. But first, if there is anyone on the council or from our audience that wants to pull an item, now is the time to speak up. Otherwise, Randy is going to take it from here. Seeing no one, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. The first item is waive full reading of all ordinances on the consent calendar. Item number two on consent is second reading of an ordinance that amends the uh, zoning title 17 to increase minimum parcel size uh, for most of our residential zones in the community. Item number three on consent is a resolution that would authorize Bruce Harry, the Director of Public Works, to execute project applications when we submit those applications to the California Department of Water Resources when we apply for the 2014 Water Energy Grants. Item number four on your consent calendar is a resolution that would provide transportation subsidies to qualified medical cannabis patients and their caregivers this was a temporary ordinance, that a resolution that had been in place um, about a year ago, and this would make it uh, permanent. This would uh, reimburse people up to $25 uh, per month uh, to and from uh, medical marijuana dispensaries for their transportation purposes, and uh, this would have a budget amendment that goes along with it. A resolution is for your approval. Number six on your consent calendar is uh, approval of contracts. And number seven are demands. Did I miss anything? Sorry. Number five is the uh, quarterly treasurer's re report, and it's in your packet for receive and file. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, moving on to public hearings. I move approval on the consent oh. calendar. Thank you. I'll second it. Second. Okay, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. All right, moving on to item number eight. Is that uh, off and calendar? this is going to be off calendar, so we'll move on to item number nine. And this is something that is going to uh, be. Madam Mayor? Yes. Just for clarification for the public, uh, what does uh, move off the calendar mean? It, well, it was removed from the calendar, so we're not going to be discussing it today. Okay, it'll be at some point in the future. I, I, if, if, go ahead, maybe Randy. Not. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. So mm -hmm. item number eight was withdrawn by the applicant because he removed the basketball um, right. hoop goals, which means that it's no longer a sports court, which means it no longer needs to meet the setback requirements. Right. So the issue has been resolved right. between the applicant and the homeowners association. Right. So the item has been removed and will not be back. It's been resolved. Yes. It's, it's resolved. Formally, it was withdrawn. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you for that clarification. Yes, we did. Okay, <laughs> moving on to item number nine. Uh, this is something that is going to be presented by uh, Bud Cop. And uh, Bud, if you would go ahead with this. Take it away. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good afternoon, members of the council. Uh, this project involves the construction of a new 26,000 square foot building adjacent to the existing Range Rover dealership to accommodate Jaguar automa automotive sales and service. The site, as shown on the screen, is 3.3 acres in size 
It's located within District 5 of the East Highway 111 specific plan. Uh, to the north across Highway 111 is commercial retail in District 4 of the specific plan. To the south across Sahara is medium density single family homes. To the east is the existing Range Rover dealership and the Rolls Royce Bentley dealership just beyond. And uh, to the west is Eric's Furniture with Audi beyond that. Uh, both of, to the east and west, those are within District 5 of the specific plan as well. Uh, as shown on the site plan on your screen, a centrally located driveway, uh, which is on the um, uh, on the right side of the screen, it's in the right and the middle. Uh, the centrally located driveway provides access to the site. The proposed building is on the east side of the driveway and is located 265 feet from uh, from Sahara Road and 300 feet from the nearest residence on Sahara Road. It's also located, the building is set back 75 feet south of Highway 111. <clears throat> the building will occur over what are currently two parcels and condition of approval number 46 has been added, which requires a parcel merger so that all facilities occur on one lot. The project has 15% building coverage, which is well below the 25% maximum permitted under the specific plan. Uh, this site plan uh, shows 245 parking spaces. The zoning ordinance requires 148, so this uh, is uh, parked well beyond the minimum requirements of code. A total of six auto display pads are proposed along Highway 111 in the landscaping, which is the maximum permitted by the zoning code. And then just in front of the showroom, you can see, a, uh, you can see some, uh, an outdoor uh, plaza area, which is also intended to display additional cars. On the west side of the driveway is parking. And uh, so the city uh, has required a three-foot architectural screen wall to screen the parking area. Uh, on this site plan, you can see that the one access point located on the left of the screen, it's located west of the proposed building. And within the site, an east-west drive aisle is located just to the south of the building, and it provides additional access to other locations, including the signalized intersection in the middle of the site uh, where the um, traffic circle feature is. Uh, no access is proposed or permitted onto Sahara Road. There has been a continuing issue with semi-trucks parking in the outer lane on Highway 111 or on other local streets uh, to either load or unload vehicles rather than entering the site. To some extent, that concern is due to the tight curb return radius on the site and the relatively steep gradient of the driveway at Highway 111. Several conditions of approval have been added to address this ongoing concern. Um, I might point out a couple of them. Condition number 25 requires the curb radius of the Jaguar driveway to be enlarged to match the other entrances on the site for, uh, to facilitate ease of semi-truck access. You can see in the upper left corner of the screen, uh, there's uh, um, a notation that shows that that curb radius would be enlarged. Uh, condition number 36 requires the project's engineer to demonstrate on the final development plan that the driveway has sufficient horizontal and vertical clearance to allow the truck access. And finally, condition number 29 requires all loading and unloading to be conducted on the project site. From east to west, the site is relatively flat, uh, but similar to other desert European motor showrooms along Highway 111, the proposed building's located about five and a half feet above the top of curb. Uh, the property continues to rise towards Sahara Road, which is 16 feet higher than the proposed pad elevation. The top of the wall on Sahara Road is about 21 and a half feet taller than the proposed pad elevation. And since the proposed building is 26 feet tall, as seen from the nearest residence, the new building will be about four and a half feet taller than the existing wall on Sahara Road, but also it will be 300 feet from the nearest residence. The existing rock fascia on the western end of Land Rover will be removed, and there will be a common wall between the two dealerships. 
The building is consistent with Jaguar's corporate design and displays a contemporary architecture with a stucco finish and light tones, as, she, as seen in the rendering here. The primary feature of the building is the rotunda on the northwest corner of the building, and that rotunda will be a slightly darker tan to provide some visual contrast with the building, and a three-foot high band of rock fascia is proposed along the front of the building, which will match the existing uh, rock on the Range Rover dealership. The bulk of the building is 26 feet in height, while the rotunda extends another one and a half feet above the roof line. The uh, height of the building is well below the maximum permitted in the zoning district, or in the specific plan district, which is 35 feet. Uh, super efficient plate glass is proposed on the north and west elevations with aluminum frames. The Architectural Review Board did have a concern over unmitigated solar exposure on the west side of the building. And as you can see here um, uh, on the left side of the screen on the bottom, uh, in response, the applicant added some metal awnings on the west facing windows. These shade structures will have a silver metal finish, extend three feet out from the building, and will have perforated metal with tubular steel frames. The service area, uh, as you see um, on the screen is a darker tone and it is architectural split face block. It has roll up doors which are positioned on the west and east <coughs> elevations that are made, uh, painted to match the color of the building walls. Uh, staff are initially was concerned about the stark contrast that the building presents when compared to the Range Rover dealership and uh, immediately to the east. However, the architectural review board felt that the contrast was appropriate. The showroom will occupy the northern half of the building, while the service area is just to the south, and it will be hidden from public view. The showroom is an open area with offices, conference rooms, support facilities around its perimeter, and including the service area, the entire building footprint is just over 22,000 square feet. Entry doors are provided to the showroom within the rotunda feature and then towards the eastern end of the building. And there is a 3,800 square foot mezzanine on the south end of the showroom, which accommodates offices and part storage. Uh, that mezzanine is accessed from the inside of the building. The service area towards the rear uh, has internal drive aisle with work bays on either side and no windows are proposed in that facility which is appropriate from both an aesthetic perspective and to minimize noise exposure. This is the landscaping plan and it includes a 25 foot wide parkway along Highway 111, perimeter landscaping and also landscaping within the parking areas. Palm trees, Palo Verde, and acacia are used, and at the request of the Architectural Review Board, additional boulder clusters have been added. The display area in front of the showroom consists of colored concrete pavers and complementary earth tones, and the dis display area will span the entire frontage of the building. Uh, in, in order to ensure that this area does not become a row of parked cars and does indeed remain uh, an attractively arranged display area, the project has been conditioned to limit the number of cars in that particular display area to three. Uh, there are, as I mentioned, six display pads located within the landscaped area, so this would give the applicant an opportunity to display nine vehicles in the front without being obstructed by uh, parking lot screen walls. The lighting plan has been carefully reviewed so that light levels don't pass beyond the property boundary and they are primarily located within the parking areas. Uh, all landscaping is limited to low wattage uh, landscape lighting. And unlike the Audi dealership to the west, the building's interior lighting does not have the potential to be excessive since there is no floor to ceiling uh, plate glass window. Nevertheless, uh, a condition of approval has been added to prevent this type of occurrence from happening again. At the October 23rd Planning Commission meeting, there was a uh, discussion on the continued issue of on-street deliveries. The Planning Commission was satisfied that the conditions of approval would assure that delivery trucks of all sizes can turn in and off of the property. And uh, 
the commission was also concerned that if one of the dealerships were to sell to a third party, access and parking could become an issue. And we did point out condition number 46, which assures that reciprocal access between the properties will be maintained. Uh, we also had story poles installed on the property, and there was a resident that uh, spoke at the Planning Commission, addressed the commission to express his concerns about the building height and potential view blockage, and he presented photos along with a simulation of how that blockage would occur. The commissioners discussed the views from Sahara Road and shared their own observations from the bus tour that we conducted in advance of the hearing. Um, the applicant requested uh, clarification of condition number 21 regarding the Sahara Road landscaping, and staff indicated that the purpose of the condition is to ensure that the landscaping is consistent with the approved Sahara Road landscaping plan. The uh, com Planning Commission expressed a concern that the landscaping on Sahara, as seen on the screen here, did not appear to have been well maintained, uh, as seen in this photo, um, and then uh, there's some dead vegetation and then uh, just some trees that need to be trimmed. Uh, so uh, the uh, commission stated that, uh, that this needed to be maintained per the approved landscaping plan and that some additional foliage on Sahara would also uh, help a screen the low profile building which really can be seen about four and a half feet above the wall. Uh, the commission recommended further enhancement of the landscaping a as a result of viewing these existing conditions on the bus tour. Uh, in the hearing, the applicant also requested that condition number 19 be modified to allow more vehicles in front of the showroom. The, uh, the planning commission stated that since there are nine places to display the vehicles, that the dealership could rotate the vehicles on the display area, which would create visual interest. Um, also, at the Planning Commission meeting, the, uh, in regard to condition number 36, the applicant requested that the required meandering sidewalk be changed to a curb-adjacent sidewalk similar to the Audi dealership. <coughs> and you can see on the screen here, this is an aerial photo of the Audi dealership with Eric's furniture just to the left. And there is a curb-adjacent sidewalk adjacent to this area, primarily because Eric's furniture uh, uh, is it, kind of a legal non-conforming type situation where it has the curb adjacent uh, due to the parking uh, configuration. And then also the curb adjacent would need to be at Mirage Road for the pedestrian crossing. Uh, the next uh, slide here shows the meandering sidewalk in front of the uh, Rolls-Bentley dealer on the right side of the screen all the way over to the um, electric um, vehicle um, establishment. Uh, we believe that, uh, uh, staff believes and also the Planning Commission agreed that the uh, city standard meandering sidewalk enhances the aesthetics and uh, they recommended compliance with that. And then also here again is a photo of the curb adjacent sidewalk with the next photo showing the city standard meandering sidewalk <coughs> that really provides some upgraded aesthetics and better pedestrian separation from Highway 111, the commission recommended that the meandering standard be applied. Uh, also, the applicant at the Planning Commission recommend, uh, requested that the 36-inch screen wall west of the entry drive be reduced in height so that the parked inventory can be seen. The commission agreed uh, with staff that the area in question is a parking lot with vehicles parked uh, approximately nine feet apart and that parking lot screening should be required. Uh, the Planning Commission following the public hearing and comment period uh, recommended <coughs> filing a categorical exemption for this project pursuant to CEQA and recommends approval of the preliminary development plan subject to the findings and conditions of approval within the staff report with two uh, minor modifications. Condition number 46 requires a reciprocal access easement to be recorded between the properties to ensure uh, reciprocal access is maintained. And condition number 21 was modified to enhance the landscaping along Sahara Road. Uh, because of the condition of landscaping along Sahara Road, as I uh, displayed in the photos, the council may wish to further modify condition number 21 to add a condition such as the applicant uh, shall rehabilitate their portion of the Sahara 
Road Landscape Parkway per the approved Sahara Road Landscape Parkway plan. This includes, but shall not be limited to, trimming of all shrubs and palms, check and fix all irrigation, remove and replace any dead or missing plant material, and a fresh layer of decompo decomposed granite shall be applied. Uh, rehabilitation of the landscaping shall be required prior to any permit issuance or within 30 days of granting this entitlement, if, if that's the council's pleasure, whichever is sooner and subject to review and approval of the planning manager. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, we do have the applicant's representative in attendance as well. Thank you. Thank you. But the, uh, the new access road will service the other dealerships, correct? So there will be no semi-trucks parked on the street anymore. The project is conditioned that all delivery and pickup be on site. And yes, the project is designed to accommodate semi-access uh, entering and exiting the site. Okay. Any but, other? Go ahead. but I don't think any of us at the council level disagree with your recommendations on the improvements on Sahara. Is there any reason we should not uh, make the improvements as you have just stated in the uh, condition? The improvements along Sahara? Yes. Uh, no, th those, uh, those are really uh, maintenance issues right now. Uh, they sh the Sahara Road should not really be in the condition it's in. And uh, we will be working with the applicant within the next 30 days to bring that up to uh, standards. Okay, so as, as you have read it and proposed, it will, if we decide to pass this issue as we're talking about, it would be so stated as you have put it in. Well, <coughs> if I may interrupt, uh, I am going to propose an amendment to, item, to condition number 21. Uh, <coughs> And what I'm going to suggest right. is that the final landscaping plan shall restore landscaping on Sahara Road, striking the words incorporate enhanced. And uh, uh, so there will be, if, if that's agreed to, there will okay. be that change. Okay, great. Okay, could I ask a couple other questions, bud? On the, on the front of the display brochure that we have, it talks about the number of required parking spaces. And as you stated in the beginning of the report, there is a 245 spaces. Can you show me by using one of the site plans where we have the 245 spaces? Yeah, that's um, there are parking spaces uh, just to the uh, to the right of the structure. It goes all the way back to the Sahara Wall which is, uh, I believe, 400 feet. It's, it's, a, big, it's a big area. It goes um, further back than that, um, all the way back to the Sahara Road Wall. And then there is also parking uh, all the way over in back of the Range Rover dealership. The, the back half of the property essentially is also parking. And then there are some parking spaces that are nestled into uh, just to the uh, west side of the service bays. And that's so, all in place now, right? Uh, a lot of the on-site part, yeah, a lot of the um, the area is paved right now, yes. So, but the, the requirement of the number of spaces is for what purpose? To provide uh, cars that are on sale uh, to park in there? It's not for customer parking. Well, it's a combination of both, really. The parking code is based on the square footage of the buildings, and uh, very little of that, obviously, would be used by customers. The majority of it would be used by inventory, but okay. uh, it, does, it does accommodate both. So are we uh, double counting the requirement for Land Rover and some of the other uh, agencies in that area as far as total number of spaces? No, this is strictly for the 26,000 square foot building that's in addition. So those spaces that you pointed out behind Land Rover are not being counted? Um, no. He's, he's, he, um, can you bring that back up on the screen, sir, please? Uh, 
um, they do they do meet the parking requirement. Um, you know, I uh, I don't have an answer to that question. Okay. I think it stands alone, bud, this project, and then Land Rover stands alone, and the other dealerships as well. That's the way that it was reviewed, yes. Okay. Can you tell me if there's any plans for doing an expansion to the west of the existing, the proposed new building and Eric's furniture? I'm not aware of any plans uh, other than the one before you today. <clears throat> okay, so that will just be used for uh, parking of excess vehicles? Yes, and as conditioned, the two parcels would be merged onto one single parcel, and if they did propose an additional building, we would review the parking again at that time. As you may recall, a few years ago, there was a Maserati dealership that was proposed on this site, and it incorporated rooftop parking. Right. Um, this, uh, and, and so there, is, there could be possibilities for uh, additional buildings on the site through creative design and screening. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Dana? Uh, could we see the area <clears throat> that relates to condition 19 where it says no more than three automobiles shall be displayed on the hardscaped uh, display area on Highway 111? Which are the, which are the six it is six currently, isn't six. that right? These. The uh, the ones closest to Highway 111 here, uh, there's six display pads located within the landscape parkway of Highway 111. Uh, those are on their own display pad set in landscaping, have boulders and uh, kind of up light, uh, landscape lighting around them. Just to the back of that, right in front of the showroom, uh, right in this area. This is a paved area that uh, originally when we looked at the landscaping plan, there were cars that were lined up across the front. And if it's, if they're lined up across the front, we determined that was more of a parking lot and we would require a parking lot screen wall. But the applicant wants to have this as kind of an outdoor display area in front of the showroom. They really don't want a three foot high parking lot screen wall to obstruct the view into the showroom. So what we're requesting is limiting this to be an attractive display area of three additional vehicles in that hardscape area. To, li to limit it, to, to add it to make it a total of six? Or to limit there, it to a There are three screen. additional uh, display pads on the west side of the entry drive. The ones across the frontage... Well, the well hang, on, hang on a second. I, I, I want to understand where you are so you can understand where I am. Uh, it was my intention to move to delete item number 19, condition number 19, that limits uh, the number of automobiles for display at only three to let it go back to six if they want to go, go back to six. The the city code that limits it to six limits it within the landscape parkway. So that that is the three on either side of the driveway along Highway 111. Okay, so the Planning Commission recommended reducing it to three. No, no. The, the, the six across the frontage that are highlighted on the screen. Right. That That is the maximum permitted by code, and the Planning Commission agreed that that's appropriate. So the total will be six to, when you count both sides. Uh, yeah, it's, and they're both sides are, are hardscape. Uh, they're they're their own uh, little display pads for each individual automobile, but those six display pads would remain three on each side of the driveway. The the three that we requested that they be limited would be the three on the paved area right in front of the showroom, in addition to the six. Because we, our concern was we didn't want this well, paved what, what area is, right. What are we, what are we limiting it f to or from? We were limiting the three in front of the showroom to a display pad rather than allowing it to turn into a parking lot without a screen. Okay, wall. Where, where were the, um, you're limiting it to three. Mm -hmm. How many is the applicant asking for and where are the other three? I, I think it is, but. Well, the Maybe applicant wrong. wanted six where it's highlighted on your screen in addition to, or five, five, I think it was, in addition to the six that were located along the parkway. So the applicant wanted the three that are circled in red, 
and three right below it, and then three to the west a couple of feet, a few feet. So the applicant wanted 369. Well, that, that's what staff, that's what the Planning Commission's recommendation is. The uh, applicant wants more than the three that are highlighted in red on the screen. I well, you've got, you, you've got to answer my questions using my words because I, I'm not, no, I don't know if we're on the same page, but the applicant wants a total of nine. Is that correct? Eleven. The applicant wants a total of eleven. Eleven. The other two are where? Where, where it's uh, highlighted in red. Well, that's three. They wanted two more than that. They wanted to be able to put a total of five in that uh, space that's now circled? Yes. And what's our objection to that? Uh, we feel that if they're attractively displayed, they will have space between them rather than just lined up to look like a parking lot. We're concerned that it'll be looking like a parking lot if we leave it at five? A parking lot without a screen wall, yes. Um, the, the problem is we're telling him how to market his own product. Uh, what if we, uh, which is something else that I was intending to do, what if we reduce the screen wall from three feet to down to one and a half, subject to staff's uh, approval? And allow five vehicles in that area? Yeah. That, that's uh, fine. We can certainly modify that condition. That's what the applicant is looking for? I think that, yeah, I think that would probably satisfy the applicant, although uh, okay. he, he's... I mean, I just don't see any reason for us not to give him full latitude to market his vehicles. Uh, uh, rather, I mean, as long as it's not disturbing the city in some burdensome or onerous way, uh, I, I personally think that we should increase that and let, let the applicant have what he wants, and that will be an amendment that I'll offer uh, when we get to that point. Certainly. The uh, the other question uh, I had had to do with um, um, well with with uh, the point I didn't make clear with respect to the um, the screen um, I'm going to suggest a permissive condition that allows them and I'll give the language in a bit but allows them to go down to one and a half feet if they wish under certain conditions. Understood. Okay. Bud, can I ask you, uh, on the landscaping across the front of the property that we just talked about, is the landscaping from the easterly edge of the, of the development all the way to the westerly edge of the parking area, is that all going to look the same as from the landscaping standpoint? Yes. Including the cars that are situated on the paths. It will be consistent across the entire project frontage. Okay, and is, is that going to look like the the rendering that we have uh, on uh, the cover of the of the illustrations? Is that going to look that way all the way across to the uh, other parking area? Well, the, uh, the rendering should depict what is shown on the landscape plans, and... Uh, Looks pretty accurate. Yes, it appears to be so. You can see there's a red car that is on the left side that's set in the landscaping, and then there's a blue car that's set in the landscaping. The, um, now, I might also mention that the Architectural Review Board did require some additional boulders to be placed within the landscaping. Okay, the, the five cars that Dana was just talking about are sitting between the building and the red and the blue car? Yes, that? those are the, uh, the uh, vehicles that are kind of parked in the background there. And uh, they would be um, displayed in front of the showroom. Okay, thank you. I, I did want to make one other comment, if I could. With respect to condition 36A, I, 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 uh, as I understand it, the applicant would like to leave the sidewalk, which is already in place, leave it there, rather than, as indicated in this condition, that it be removed the existing sidewalk. Do we have a photograph of that uh, sidewalk by any chance?
Yeah, I guess that's it. Um, I, I think we should treat this bit of sidewalk much as we did with the Audi sidewalk, just a few feet uh, away. And we didn't uh, make them tear it up and put it, make it a winding, uh, which uh, a meandering, when to use the words here, a meandering bike path. Uh, but rather just allow that to remain in place um, rather than tearing it out and having them go to that expense. Um, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be treated the same as we did for Audi. And so I, I will be suggesting a modification of that condition to eliminate the first uh, sentence of uh, 36AIII, which in effect would allow them just to leave the bike path that's there in place. Okay. So that whole paragraph is going to be eliminated? No, not the whole paragraph, just the first sentence. Starting with plans four and ending with along the frontage. Where are you? You said 36A, I, I, Yeah, on page 9-23. 9-23. Oh. At the very top, that I, I, I. Okay. It'll be to strike that, that sentence, which in effect will allow okay. the existing bike path to exist as is. But in, in regard to the truck access, are you comfortable with the, the proposal uh, and feel that that will do away with the problem we have right now as far as trucks parked on the highway? Yes, we were very concerned about that issue when we reviewed the, uh, the project. We have included three conditions to that effect. One will increase the curb radius into the property, which uh, the public uh, works department, city engineer will determine, will, uh, they will determine that it will meet the, uh, the wheelbase of the semi-trucks. Also, the grade will be shown on the final development plan to be acceptable so that they can access it with the semi-trucks. And then there is a specific condition that all loading and unloading occur on the project site. Well, will that be, um, will that meet the, the requirements if those, if those shops are shut down and there's nobody there? Where, are they still gonna be able to park their trucks, bring those trucks into parking? If, even if the uh, stores are shut down? There, uh, the site plan does not show any gates that would prohibit that from occurring. So they would be able to load and unload. It's my understanding that usually loading and unloading occurs during the regular business operations when they can receive for uh, d dispatch vehicles though. There's a lot of deliveries real early in the morning. Okay. Yeah. They can access the site without going through a gate. Okay, thank you. But do we know how long an average delivery time is? I don't, I don't know. Um, our code compliance division and the sheriff's department would have that information. Okay, thank you. Any more questions or comments? Okay. <coughs> Any questions or comments from the audience? Okay, the public hearing is open. And we have someone, Chris Hector, who is going to come down and give us some more information. He is representing the Desert European Motor Cars. Madam Mayor, members of the council and staff, uh, my name is Chris Hector and I'm representing Desert European Motor Cars. Mr. Blue regretfully regrets that he couldn't attend today because he's traveling um, out of state. Um, what I'd like to do, I, I think may, I might be able to clarify a couple of concerns about this patio area. If it's possible, could we go back to that one, um, I believe it was number 10, uh, or, or the, uh, that showed that? When you say number 10, you're talking about the position? No, I'm sorry, number 10 that uh, on the, uh, well, here we can see it up here. Well, the number 10, I think it was, on the, where he, what uh, the condition uh, requested by staff is where it's circled that we be limited to three vehicles there. This is a large area, enhanced 
concrete and display area, very nice. It is consistent with what we have right adjacent to it in Land Rover and also in front of Building A and um, the other uh, facilities at Desert European. This area is basically used, will be used for, for two things. One, Jaguar itself has se uh, six new models coming back out. And during our beautiful winter months that we have now, the clientele likes to, you know, be outside and see this. Those cars won't be lined up, per se, as a parking lot. They're display to display all uh, six brands. We will also use that to, um, when people buy their cars and stuff, they will, they will get ready and, 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 and pick up their car from there during the winter months. So the opposition or the question that we have is just don't condition us to, to only having three cars in that beautiful area up there. We'd like to be able to, to, to tastefully display, you know, five cars up there so the clientele can see that. Secondly, if we could have that uh, same uh, sign up there, the area that Mr. Kopp was speaking to the west adjacent to uh, Eric's furniture um, staff is requesting that we put this three-foot wall directly behind those three featured car displays there um, what that area behind that will be all new car inventory where all, all uh, different models different colors will be displayed it's not an area where the public will park it's not an area where uh, Service vehicles will park. There's more than enough room for service vehicles deeper back into the project that won't be seen by the public. But Desert European Motor Cars feels that that's, you know, an important area for the sales of their vehicles. So as people are driving down 111, they can see that car. They can see the colors of the cars, things like that, and, uh, and use that. So our request there is to eliminate that three-foot wall and... Uh, it's tastefully landscaped there. The front six pads are for featured vehicles. They're rotated uh, uh, very often, every two to three days. So that changes there to catch the, the public's eye so they can see what we're, what we're having to... Uh, you don't have any problem with 18 inches? Well, we already have uh, an existing 18-inch wall that's right behind the bike path now. Um, if you remember from the previous shot that showed it uh, as is down in front of Eric's furniture, that is the same wall that is existing now all the way to Land Rover. It's the way the wall was existing. That's 18 inches? Yes. Uh, it was uh, right there. It's a well, if we gave you the option of uh, reducing uh, anywhere from 36 feet uh, inches uh, down to at least 18 inches, with that works. That wall. works for you. Yeah. An additional wall. Uh, that would certainly be better because, as you're well aware, Jaguars and some of these European uh, vehicles now are all low-profile cars, and it is elevated. That area is elevated from the street. So if you put a three-foot wall there and put a low-profile vehicle behind it, and someone's driving down 111, they're just barely going to see the top of a car. So that's why we were requesting if we could eliminate it there. On that wall, that existing 18-inch wall, we'll do the same as shown in the rendering. We're going to clad all the front of it with uh, stack stone, which matches Desert European and matches Audi, and we put a new cap on it, and I, I think everyone will agree it's, it's very attractive. That's what it'll look like right there. Good. How much of those of the cars that we're talking about right here in that first row how much of that height is actually going to be above those other cars that are parked on the pedestals? Um, are, they, are you going to be able to see those other cars? In between them, you will. There's, there's almost um, 120 feet in that section from driveway to Eric's furniture, and there's just the three feature display pads there. The problem with the display pads and with that wall there is it can't be, even if the wall was there, we have to have breaks in the wall because you have to be able to load those pads from behind. You can't do it from the front going up. So as we're showing it, as we were requested to show it, we have breaks in it so we can load the cars from the back. But again, when that wall is there and if it's 36 inches high from the street, 
someone driving by in a car is not going to be able to see the vehicle be behind that wall if that wall goes in. And, and we feel that's an important sales aspect to, to be able to see the, the, uh, the beautiful new car inventory there. As consistent with Desert European down the, uh, in front of uh, Land Rover, in front of uh, Porsche, those buildings there, so we don't have a wall that, that uh, hides that patio. Um, as far as the other conditions that uh, have been requested, we have no problem with that. As far as the Harrow Road, uh, I appreciate the, uh, the new verbiage put in there. I have uh, spoken with our landscape maintenance company that uh, takes care of that and and uh, unfortunately that one picture that's shown is just one 12 foot area the majority of that area back there has nice trees and palms and everything like that but certainly we have no objection to going in and and, uh, and cleaning and make it look as, as attractive as it should be in the city of Rancho Mirage. Do you have any any problem with the uh, bike path being a continuation of what you've already got or would you prefer to put in a meandering? We would like to leave it the way it is because as with when it came up from Audi, a meandering sidewalk would not connect to a meandering sidewalk on either end. It would it would be a straight. And uh, um, as it is in front of Land Rover, it's a straight bike path. In front of Eric's, in front of Audi, it's it's that way all the way. And it all has that small 18-inch wall right next to it. So that's why we're requesting to leave it the way it is. Bud, where does the meandering bike path actually start? In Palm Desert. <laughs> you know, uh, it, pretty much beyond the, ro if you go east of the Rolls Bentley dealership, right. it appears to continue east. I'm not sure where it stops. Uh, it's, it's pretty consistent. So everything between uh, Audi and Bentley, or that main area of the building, that's all just straight, uh, non-meandering? Yes, uh, the Range Rover dealership is the first curb adjacent sidewalk, and it's a fairly short span in that area, uh, but it does continue across Eric's Furniture and the new Audi dealership. So the meandering section would actually be out of character with what we already have there. Uh, it would, well, it, it would not be consistent between the Audi dealer and Range Rover, but it is the city standard and it, in staff's opinion, um, it does have an increased level of aesthetics and, you know, we look at projects to try and get a high level of uh, aesthetics out of it as well. I agree that it's high, a higher level of aesthetics. It just seems uh, to be uh, a burden to change it out here where we didn't change it out for Audi and uh, a nice properly treated sidewalk or bike path, although albeit straight, uh, still an attractive uh, amenity in front of it. So, and I think staff's on the right track talking about meandering as being attractive and, and urging us to go that way. I just think the practicalities of this situation pretty much augur against it. That's all. But it's, it's certainly something that we should be addressing at every opportunity, and I appreciate the fact that uh, staff is recommending that we follow code. Madam Mayor, can I ask something? Sure. Um, do you know what the width of the sidewalk is in front of the Audi the curb adjacent? It's only four feet. It's at four feet wide? Five feet? Five feet. All the way down from, from the corner of Mirage all the way down to um, the because drive. Typically, our, our minimum standard for behind curb, if we have it, is six feet. That's our standard. Except what that is now, but obviously mm -hmm. this met code back at the time it was created. At least I'm assuming it. Well, I, th I think I think the Audi was given an exception because there was an existing wall already there. Well, no, yeah, I'm not talking about Audi. Audi, it wasn't there, but the sidewalk was there in front of Audi, I think. Yes, it was. It was an older sidewalk. And then the sidewalk here has been in front here for a number of years, 
And whenever it first went in, I'm presuming that it went in according to code. Would you presume otherwise? I think I think the sidewalk that was in front of Audi before, that had been there for I'm quite not, some well, time. Forget yeah. Audi for a second, but how about the sidewalk in front of uh, Desert European Motors? I think that's wider. That's a, is that an eight foot sidewalk in front of Desert European? I think well, it's eight foot. In front, of, in front of the Land Rover Range Rover building, it, it's a five foot sidewalk that matches is. what's all the way down to Mirage. And, and there is that small, that 18 inch wall just behind it that mm -hmm. is consistent all the way down, except for in front of Eric's because they use theirs for an entire. Yeah, Eric's is a complete driveway yeah, approach. Yeah. Yeah. Randy? Sorry. Yes. And there are existing utilities, water meters, sewer uh, clean outs, fire hydrants that are existing in there that if you went to a meandering sidewalk, those would all have to be uh, redone, removed, and moved to quite an expense, go back into the city on laterals. Well, my only concern is that we provide enough width for two, two pedestrians to walk by or a bicycle on a pedestrian. I just want to make sure we have adequate width because what he says uh, if there are utilities like fire hydrants and stuff, if they're curb adjacent, which they typically are, they're usually 18 to 20 inches back a curb. Um, a curb adjacent sidewalk may limit that sidewalk here. I just want to make sure that we got enough for two people to pass. That's all. I haven't heard of a problem. It just seems, you know, there's bike, bikers going down there and pedestrians. It's been fun. Mm -hmm. We'll put in a signal just in case it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd like to address one other thing, if I could. The uh, the concern about the uh, unloading and, uh, and uh, loading of uh, vehicle transports and stuff like that. We have, uh, at the suggestion of Mr. Harry, we've gone ahead and, and purchased uh, signs that say truck and transport entrance 500 feet. And then we have one that says where to enter with an arrow. And they should be arriving uh, in the next couple of days. We're going to temporarily put them up. Um, to direct the transports to the end of Desert European going down the alley. And then when this project is completed, we will we are showing those uh, currently on our precise grading plan and we'll put it at this main entrance and 500 feet before that. So well, I think that's a good idea. As you know, uh, this has been an ongoing problem before you took over ownership there. And it's one that uh, has really beset the city uh, Far too frequently, when we have those big vehicles with all the cars they're covering, they come up in front, they stop, they block Highway 111, the full lane they block uh, when it's there. The problem of getting them in and all of that, where they're going to park, it's something that code enforcement has just been driven nuts about, and I suspect you as well. So we really are looking forward to you remedying that situation because that, that does pose a serious hazard and danger to motorists along the way there. It's, it's been a pain <laughs> when we agree. I've been involved with, with Desert European for the last 12 years in the design and, and build it, and, and, and we realize what the problem is, not making excuses. You know, uh, we know that what the difficult to get these independent transport drivers who we don't have um, the ability to schedule or, or talk to, but in this design, we've widened the drive approach they will turn in there, be able to go on a straight line all the way to the back of the property, turn and unload at the back, and then they will proceed down to the easterly end of the project and come out and go down the alley and exit out. So I think we also, Randy, correct me if I'm wrong, but haven't we also tried to make it a little easier for your transportation uh, companies bringing cars in to park on the, uh, uh, for a period of time, up to two or three hours on the uh, uh, what, what's the word? Front, what frontage road. road? Yeah. Frontage road, yes. Right, so we've, we've tried to give you more of a break there than you had before so that they wouldn't be ticketed uh, automatically, virtually. I think this will be the answer and, and, and solve our problem with the signage mm -hmm. and, and direct them. And everyone, uh, the employees have been alerted that if a, a driver comes or stop, you know, direct him to where he comes, bring him in. We have interior signs on the property that tell him where to stop and we direct him to where we, we have him unload. To answer your question, it takes, if it's a full transport, which can carry up to you know, seven to eight cars, it, it takes a little while to get them 
to get them off and then they have to be accepted and looked at. So this is an area where they can, they can have that time and it can be done properly and solve the problem. <coughs> Can they enter only through one of the two entrance exits? And entrance? They can actually come in to come in at the main one that we're going to do this way, go to the back and exit, mm -hmm. or if they happen to miss that, they can go down to the end where we have signage now too that says truck entrance and they can come in the back and circle around that way and come out. So they only have to make two turns. They're not meandering in an inventory or anything in sharp turns. We've uh, made uh, efforts to take the landscape areas and make a softer radius so they're not driving over a corner of it. We've looked at it and I, I, again, I <clears> feel pretty confident that we've got this problem solved. What is your timetable once uh, this is approved to put the shovel on the ground? Um, with approval of this, we're anticipating within a couple of weeks of submitting our uh, construction documents to building and we hope to be, have a shovel in the ground before Christmas. Any further questions or comments? Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Well, if there's no further questions or okay. comments, Dana, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, and sure. Uh, let, let me make the uh, proposed amendments. Uh, close the public hearing first. Okay. No further questions. We do have some comments from the audience. We do. Uh, we do or don't? Do. We do. Please come forward and state your name and your place of residence. My name is David Stokes. I live on Sahara, right behind the Jaguar dealership. Can you speak a little louder? Yes. Um, I'm, my name is David Stokes. I live on Sahara Road, right behind the Jaguar dealership. When we had the last meeting, we 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 actually discussed the gap in the in the landscaping on Sahara. You know, because uh, it looks quite old now, as the photograph showed you. And um, the reason for that was that two trees. Are, Two trees had been cut down, so the uh, excuse me, so the um, landscaping looks a little sparse in that area. So, if we're just going to maintain it, then it just means putting decomposed granite and leaving it there. I thought we were going to put, I thought we were going to replant those trees so the so the gap would be filled in and it wouldn't be so aesthetically unpleasing. Okay. <laughs> and I think Mr. Hobart mentioned that. Okay, Randy, could you please make comment? Sure, Mr. Stokes. The conditions of approval will require that Desert European reestablish the approved landscape plan, which means replacing those trees, not just G DG. And okay, yes. I just wanted to make that point, that's all. Thank you. And thank you for your comments. You. Okay, any other speakers from the audience? All right, we'll close public comments. And Dana, would yeah, you like to go sure. ahead? Yes, uh, okay. I would move uh, approval of the preliminary development plan case number PDP 14002 subject to the findings and conditions of approval included in this staff report together with the following amendments that I'm about to propose. With respect to condition number 19 to strike it in its entirety. But it says now is no more than three automobiles shall be displayed on the hardscape uh, display area on Highway uh, 111. Uh, second, uh, with respect to condition number 20, uh, to modify it in the following manner. The final landscaping plan shall incorporate, strike the word potted, shall incorporate Palms in annual color adjacent to the display area north of the dealership showroom. Randy, is that clear to you? Yes. It is to me, but I want to make sure it was. Okay. And then with respect to uh, condition number 21, to amend it in the following way. The final landscaping plan shall restore, add the word restore, strike the words incorporate enhanced. So it'll so far say, shall restore landscaping on Sahara Road, strike the words 
in addition to the required landscaping so that it will say restore landscaping on Sahara Road consistent with the Sahara Road landscaping guidelines had a comma instead of a period there to the satisfaction of staff. Then with respect to um, uh, the permissive condition, I would suggest that it be condition 21A and that condition read, would read as follows. The 36 inch screened area shown on applicant's plan may be reduced to 18 inches so long as it, as it is architecturally treated to staff satisfaction. Then, a comment on that? Yes. The 36 inch screen area, I think you mean 36 inch screen wall. Yes, what did I say? Area. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, wall, screen wall. Okay, and then for condition number 36, AIII, strike the first sentence on page 9-23, strike the first sentence of that condition, which will eliminate the words plan for the required eight foot wide class one meandering bike path per standard drawing 500 shall be submitted to the city engineer and shall be shown on the landscape and plans and shall be constructed along the frontage. Okay, I think that covers the amendments that I was intending to make. Okay. Yes, yeah, so that's the motion. Okay, that covers it, and I will second that. So please, cast your vote. And the motion carries 5-0. Thank you so much, and thank you, Dana, for all your input. Pleasure. Okay. So we'll be moving on now to item number 10. And this is something that Jeremy Gleim, our planning technician, is going to be covering. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Um, good afternoon. Uh, the applications listed on your screen have been submitted in conjunction with the remodel and revitalization of the Rancho Los Palmas Shopping Center. The project site lies at the northeast corner of Highway 111 and Bob Hope Drive. Approval of the existing shopping center was granted in 1978, and the site has functioned as a shopping center since that time. This project is multifaceted in nature and includes a large amount of demolition, reconstruction, and refacing. The applicant is proposing new storefront systems, shade elements, and finishes for the buildings which are to remain, and there will be a collective loss of 102 square feet of building area when the entire project is completed. This slide shows the zoning for the subject property, which is CN, uh, Neighborhood Commercial. This slide also shows the zoning uh, designations for the adjacent surrounding properties. These images show the site plan as it currently exists. The exhibit on the right highlights the structures which are slated for demolition. And as we move through the slides, you will see why the demolition of these buildings is critical to the redevelopment effort. The image on the right here shows the proposed site plan. The buildings which are highlighted in green represent those which will be reconstructed. And as displayed, they are located at significant locations within the project site. Buildings K, M, and N will be highly visible to passing motorists and will become the most identifiable structures within the context of the project. Also of note on the site plan is the proposed mid-block entry along Highway 111 and the newly signalized intersection at the project's uh, the project's northern extent where it intersects with Bob Hope Drive. Three major issues were identified with the project's current configuration. Number one, there is no direct access into the site from Highway 111. Number two, vehicles cannot turn left onto Bob Hope Drive when exiting the site. 
And number three, there is no convenient pedestrian connection between the Rancho Las Palmas Shopping Center and the river. All of these issues have been addressed with this proposal, uh, with the addition of the right in, right out entry from Highway 111 and the newly signalized intersection at the project's northernmost entry. And although the collective square footage of building space will actually decrease, the number of parking spaces will increase by 36 stalls. The applicant was able to do this by reorganizing the southern portion of the project. The landscape plan for the project is quite extensive and rich in climate appropriate plant types. The area that is shaded in yellow represents the portion of the project which will receive a complete rehab. This area is dense with parking lot trees and various pedestrian amenities. Uh, the project has been outfitted with a multitude of outdoor plazas, which include such things as public seating, raised planters, water features, upgraded paving material, and accent trees. The plazas are linked to one another via pathways that traverse the site. Uh, these pathways are easily identifiable due to their upgraded paving material, and they will offer pedestrians a safe option for moving about the site on foot. Uh, shaded seating areas um, adorn the pathways and offer areas of refuge that are protected from vehicular movement. A substantial grade change exists between Highway 111 and the two new buildings that lie closest that thoroughfare. Uh, the buildings are between 8 and 10 feet below the Highway 111 curb height. This is important to keep in mind as the entire site slopes downward from Highway 111 towards the north. The image on the left here shows the color and material selections that have been chosen for the project. There are a total of three, three plaster colors, a composite siding, corten steel, and two metal finishes. All of the color selections are subdued in nature and are reflective of the surrounding environment. And at this point, I'd like to uh, discuss each of the individual buildings, but we'll spend the majority of time discussing the four newly proposed buildings. Building A is the major tenant space that exists amongst the inline tenants and the location of the former Vons grocery store. The improvements for this building, along with all of the other buildings which uh, will essentially remain, whose footprints will not change, uh, will be limited to facade upgrades. A tower feature will be erected over the store's main entry, and the pitched clay tile roof will be removed in favor of a contemporary flat roof. Again, these are typical changes for all of the existing buildings which are to remain. Roof heights will range from 24 to 27 feet in height, with the tower features reaching a height of 40 feet. Building B currently houses the CVS Pharmacy and is the first of four buildings which is to be demolished and reconstructed. A tower feature will flank the building's main entry and will reach a height of 45 feet. An additional entry feature will extend to a height of 35 feet and the rest of the structure will be 29 feet in height. 18 inch built out panels will be used to add depth to the facade at various locations and will feature the composite siding. And the applicant has also placed architectural reveals at 23 feet intervals along all of the elevations to break up what would otherwise be a, a large expanse of, of uh, blank wall. Building D houses the Wells Fargo Bank and will not change in footprint. Upgrades for this building will be limited to facade improvements. Heights for this building will range from 16 feet 6 inches to 18 feet in height with a tower element uh, reaching a height of 29 feet. Buildings F and G will maintain their existing footprints as well and will be outfitted with new facade systems. Heights for this building range from 14 to 22 feet uh, with a centrally located architectural feature extending to 27 feet in height. Uh, improvements to building H will also be limited to facade upgrades and roof heights will range from 16 to 22 feet in height. Buildings I and J are the last of the inline tenant spaces, and again, they will be simply outfitted with new facade systems. Um, the, footprint, the footprint of these structures will not change. Roof heights will range from 16 to 22 feet in height, and the centrally located architectural feature will reach a height of 28 feet. Building K is the second of the four buildings which are to be demolished and reconstructed. 
A major variance was submitted for the development of this building for two reasons. Number one, a reduced setback was being requested on the building's east side. And number two, the circular tower feature at the building's southeast corner extends beyond the required height limit. Staff is supportive of the request for the 22-foot setback due to the fact that the existing building, <coughs> which currently sits on that site, maintains the same 22-foot setback. The required setback at this location is 25 feet, so a 22-foot setback would constitute uh, a 12% deviation from the requirement. Building K sits approximately 10 feet below Highway 111. Staff feels that this difference in grades can be counted as a credit for the building's height due to the fact that if there was no grade change, a 20-foot high building would be permitted at this location. What this does is give the opportunity uh, of the applicant to erect a 30-foot tall building at the setback line. The circular tower feature uh, extends to a height of 36 feet 6 inches and exists only 1 feet beyond the setback line. And because this will be the first building that motorists see as they approach the project from the east, um, it is considered to be an important wayfinding mechanism and also an iconic building within the overall project. Staff believes that the architectural design of the building is appropriate for this unique location, but feels that the circular tower element should be limited in height to 33 feet 6 inches, which would provide an appropriate transition in building heights along this corridor from the Goodwill Building, which lies opposite Magnesia Falls Drive, all the way to the river, which lies opposite Bob Hope Drive. The iconic aesthetic of the building would still be maintained, and it would only constitute a 13% deviation from the standard requirement. The additional roof heights for this building range from 16 to 28 feet in height, and the tower feature at the north, uh, over the north entry reaches a maximum height of 32 feet. Jeremy, if I could just interrupt for one second, mm -hmm. then you can continue. The 13% and the 12% variances that he was just talking about, they're considered major variances, as you can see on the title. Anything less than 10% is technically considered minor, so that's <coughs> why it's major. Um, so building M lies at the corner of Highway 111 and Bob Hope Drive. A conditional use permit is required for the development of this building due to the fact that a drive through element is being proposed. The drive through window itself will be located at the building's northwest corner. Staff believes that this is the ideal location for this element as its users will not interfere with other visitors of the site. An eight foot grade change exists between Highway 111 and this building. So the drive through element itself will be naturally screened um, from that grade change. Roof heights range from 25 to 30 feet in height with tower elements reaching a maximum height of 36 feet four inches. And building N is the last of the four buildings which is to be demolished and eventually reconstructed. This building lies just south of the mid-block entry from Bob Hope Drive. A major variance was submitted in conjunction with this development um, due to an overheight request. Two tower features adorn the, this, this building's north side, one on the northwest corner and one on the northeast corner. Um, the tower feature at the northwest corner has been located at the setback line and extends to a height of 28 feet, which is 8 feet beyond the maximum height limit. The grade elevation at this location is actually one foot above the adjacent Bob Hope Drive curb height, so the tower would appear as a 29-foot structure from the street. As previously discussed for Building K, the unique location of Building N allows it to become a, a focal point and a wayfinding tool for passing motorists. <clears throat> Staff is recommending that the tower feature be limited to 25 feet in height so that, so that it fits in context with the rest of the center. And at 25 feet in height, there would still be undulation between the, the building's adjacent roofs. And it would limit the deviation to 25% above what the code requires. Additional roof heights for this building range from 23 feet 6 inches to 28 feet in height, and the tower element on the northeast corner of the building reaches a height of 34 feet. So that's basically the project um, as it's been proposed with all the new buildings, the reconstruction, the demo, and the two new entries. So with that, uh, based on the content findings and conditions of the staff report, the Planning Commission has recommended approval of this project, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Is Building K the uh, Brandini building? 
Yes, that's correct. And is that going to be demolished? Right? That's correct. And what about the um, where Brandini's is going, which was the old Tuesday morning? Is there going to? There was conversation at one time that there was going to be a um, stop sign and stop light or lighting there to go into that building for so, the street traffic. Right. So the new signalized intersection will take place right here next just north of the Wells Fargo building. The old Tuesday morning building is here in the back of the site and it will be upgraded with facade improvements as well. Um, but that's essentially a kind of a back road be, that goes behind all the shopping centers. And Brandini's is taking that building? It's my understanding, yes. Okay. Jeremy, do you happen to know if anything is going to be done with the basement uh, under Brandini's, or are they going to be using it? I know I, it's a very large area. I viewed it last year, and uh, it's quite a place over there. <clears throat> that was the old airport it, it, yeah, building. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's my understanding that Brandini's currently asked to house their product off-site, so that basement would be an ideal location for them to house all their product. They would be able to do their manufacturing and storage in that location. Okay. Right. Any other questions? A uh, question regarding CVS. I know there was some discussion uh, at the Planning Commission regarding the hours of operation. And has it been decided yet as to whether um, they are going to ask for 24-7 uh, or something less than that? It's my understanding they want the ability to operate 24 hours, but that, that decision has not been made yet. They just want the opportunity, or should the need arise, they want the ability to do that. So would they need to come back to us once they make a decision as to get approval from the council? The way the, the condition was crafted... Um, So if you refer to page 10-62 at the top, it says the CVS site shall be permitted a 24-hour operation. However, the city council reserves the right to modify the hours of, of the operation if there are noise complaints by the community or nuisance issues created by the 24 operation. So at this point, they would have the ability to do that. They would have the ability to go 24-7 without coming back to the council. That's, That's correct. correct. Okay. Thank you. Right. What kind of a time frame are we looking at? That this would from start to finish, a couple of years, or? Yeah, that'd be a better question for the for the applicant. I, I don't know that. Okay. Also, um, I see about twenty or twenty-one tenants that are proposed at this point. Are any of those units um, going to possibly be um, subdivided in the future? Is there room for that, or? That's um, they talk about? No, that's a good question. It's not something that's come up. Um, I think when we look at the sign program later, th there's really only space for a, a, a certain number of tenants, so I don't know that they could subdivide a whole lot in that center. Okay. Dana, go ahead. Go ahead, Dana. Go ahead, Dana. The, um, page 10-4, the language, the recommended language coming from the Planning Commission is that trash bins be upgraded. To what extent is the city benefited by having it any more specific than that? Or is up, does upgraded have some kind of a meaning that the developer and uh, we should also know? I think that this issue was mostly specific to the, the trash bins at the, near the loading docks behind the buildings. They were in a state of disrepair. Um, as far as the, the trash bins within the project site, um, for instance, in the parking lot areas, I don't know that there are any. So it would basically be specific to those behind the loading docks. The, um, the other vague issue I, I had was right below that, the former Tuesday morning building be upgraded with the rest of the center. Uh, what is the suggested upgrading that we're dealing with here? 
The upgrades for that would also be limited to facade improvements, uh, shade systems, and, and the like, as with the existing buildings that uh, aren't going to change their footprints. Are these either the trash bin upgrading or the upgrading of the uh, Tuesday morning building? Uh, do these carry with it the addition of to the satisfaction of staff, or is that it's not required under no, these circumstances. It is required um, just due to the fact that we haven't seen any proposals for either of these things, so they would have to be approved by the planning staff. Well, do we have to add conditions, or would that be part of us, part of what we are approving, that those will be dealt with by staff and the applicant? It would be, um, it would be part of my motion to include that. Oh, okay. Um. <clears throat> Oh, and with respect to um, condition number 23 on page 10-4, at least, because I'm sure it's somewhere else as well, uh, having to do with the bus stops, uh, maybe if you do a motion, uh, Ted, at the, at the end of that sentence, uh, turning the word cent center period to a comma, and comply with other conditions required by Sunline Transportation Agency. I think we've got to get Sunline approving these as well. Okay. Also, it has Condition, uh, I'm looking at page 10-4 in what is numbered 23. All right, regarding that the applicant shall design and construct bus shelters. Right. Have they already submitted that des a design? They have not, not yet. It'll be done as part of the final <coughs> development plan. Okay, but and will that be constructed fairly soon or is it gonna be? going along with the average construction time? It, it would be done with, in conjunction with the center. Uh, I don't know whether it would be done initially or towards the end, um, but it would be done as part of the center's reconstruction. Okay. Okay. I think we have to add there that they have to meet the standards of Sunline Transportation Agency. Right. I, have a, I have a question about that. Um, are we still having an issue with how Sunline wants whether they want curb cuts or they don't for their bus stops? That's, when we, uh, when we route these for comment, that gives them the opportunity to ask or to add conditions and they basically left it open saying that they don't need any more resources at these locations. Um, but again, it's something we could reach out to them and inquire about when we submit the uh, bus shelter designs themselves. Are there turn-in lanes on Nova 11 okay. going into the main entrance? There's going to be no deceleration lane at that location. Okay. All right. I have a question on the landscape plan, which is uh, page four of the <coughs> of the large brochure. Specifically, having to do with building I and J. Can you bring that up, uh, page four? That's it. Oh. Um. It's the uh, enlargement buildings, one uh, I and J. That's it. Can you go into a little bit uh, detail there as to what is going to be planned? And uh, throughout the, the entire project, we have a sidewalk uh, running uh, through the to the various businesses. Here it looks like we have an outdoor eating area, and the issue with the sidewalk would be handled how? This, er this whole area is going to be redone. Uh, as you can see, it ranges from 20 feet to 60 feet in length from uh, the front of the building to a parking stall. The actual layout of this uh, will probably be modified somewhat depending on the tenants, but there is ample room for outdoor dining opportunities, certainly in Building J and in front of Building I where it juts back out. But uh, the area will be upgraded with pavers. 
uh, seating and accent trees. Okay, we'd have the same pavers uh, as in other areas of the development? That's correct. Okay. And are all the walkways uh, color pavers? All of the new areas, yeah, are, are color pavers, just like you see here. And then the, the pathways that connect them are, will be created from uh, interlocking pavers, discernible from the rest of the uh, pavement. And will there be any pavers going across the parking lot from one side to the other? Yes. So if you look at the screen here, um, let me get the, so this, so you, you can see a plaza here, large plaza. This area that's in red is a, is a paved pedestrian walkway that connects to this building. And then those are consistent to all of the other, all of the other buildings throughout the site. So you'll be, you will be able to, to walk throughout the site on uh, the site on a dedicated uh, pedestrian walkway. Will you be able to walk from Bob Hope's side to the Steinmart building? The easy, well, that would probably be the easiest way would be starting at building N. You could traverse the site and then, uh, and then down to this area. That would probably be the easiest way for pedestrians on, on foot. Okay, thank you. I have one question in regard to the Steinmart building on page uh, 22 of the large book. Is that the uh, final rendering of what they're planning to do and the appearance that they're planning to maintain? And is that uh, just a contrasting paint colors or are the dark colors actually going to be some type of textured something or any kind of stacked rocks or? That's, there's no stacked stone or anything. It's all just stucco color. Um, that, that's basically what that, that building facade will look like. Okay. Is that com according to the Steinmart's own wishes? Uh, is that a corporate decision of what their buildings are to? to I don't believe it's a corporate design. I think it's just using the colors that, uh, that were part of the color palette for the whole center. Um, is there any way we can um, add some kind of condition where they can make it a little bit more attractive and, you know? Sure, sure. We could have them, uh, we could certainly add a condition to upgrade with um, composite yeah. siding or stone uh, to the satisfaction of the planning okay. department. Absolutely. I think that would be good. And I think that the, uh, uh, in fact, I, some wording here that we might be able to use is additional building articulation shall be provided on the front elevation if, and then it can be um, included in the final development plan to be improved by staff. Sure, that'll be fine. Okay, any other questions or comments? Ted, were you going to no, elaborate? I think, uh, I'll save my comments till after the applicant. Okay. No other questions or comments? All right. I, the applicant is here, so I believe you would like to come up and fill us in on some more details. Please state your name. Honorable Mayor and Council Members, my name is Erwin Busey. I'm with Paragon <coughs> Commercial Group. And I just want to say thank you to staff and all the city of Ranch Mirage. It has really been a team effort from where we started to where we are today. It really has been a, uh, a good journey. It's been hard, but it's been a good journey. We have a, uh, um, I think, a wonderful project with some wonderful tenants with great pedestrian connectivity, enhanced landscaping, um, great architecture. And to just address the Steinmark comment, this is way beyond their typical elevations. We, we have been working with all the tenants to really upgrade their elevations in terms of their look and the articulation in the building, because this is an important asset for us to make sure that we deliver a quality of development to the city branch barrage. So you're saying that what they have here in the rendering is 
meets your approval? It does meet my approval, correct. And, and it's beyond what we originally started with significantly. I, I wanted to take a couple moments to address just a couple other, other uh, comments. Uh, regarding the bus shelters, that is going to be part of the first phase. As a condition of delivery to CVS, we're required to complete uh, uh, the offsites, which includes the new access point on 111. And with that, we'll be also be incorporating the, um, the bus shelter. And we're fine with that uh, condition. All I don't want to do is, is, is be in a position where there's, future, there's more dedications required on Bob Hope. What I'd like to do is keep it to the existing structure and make sure that it ties in with the, the rest of the shopping center. Um, regarding Brandini, it is a perfect building for them. They are storing product off-site. They can consolidate, use the basement. Uh, we have not um, come up with a facade yet because quite honestly, we've been, we've been working with a, a few other things that we needed to solve, uh, but we're, we're getting there and we will have something that is approved by staff and also compatible with, with the rest of the center. Um, demising, and in, in, really there's not a lot of demise, a lot of the spaces are already demised. Our focus has been really to get the, the anchor tenants solidified and, and done, and we think we've got a great lineup. There's gonna continue to be um, more progress. The project itself is gonna take roughly on a good day, 18 months to 24 months, which my construction manager has promised me, which is great. Um, <laughs> inside, inside joke there. Um, and goal is, is to start construction on or before Christmas as well. We're, we're committed to fast tracking this. Uh, CBS has some specific schedules that we wanna meet as well as uh, our other tenants as well. I'm happy to answer any other questions that you have. Um, we're excited about the project. There was uh, there was the question that um, the mayor asked regarding Steinmart and the facade. You want to address that? Well, the in, in terms of Steinmart, the facade has met with our approval, and we've gone back and forth with Steinmart pretty significantly, and and. Uh, what I would like is to maintain the existing elevation because I know that's already been routed and approved through through real estate committee. We can we can add some accents in terms of landscaping to really it add some breakup to that facade and really provide I think uh, contrast within that facade. So that's what I'd like to do. Right. Ted, that's it for you. <coughs> So, so then in other words, there is, there will be no change at Steinmark, what you're saying. In other words, what we see is what you get. Well, that's my wish, but right. you know, I wish for a lot of things, so. Well, th basically, I think what we're saying is if you change that, it would, it would then not match the rest of the center. Is well, I correct? think we keep the facade the same. I think, I think there's, there's maybe there's an opportunity in my thought was to add some some land whether it's creeping vine or something to that effect to add some contrast to the building um, in terms of, of um, other architectural materials we've spent a lot of time on the design with Steinmart in terms of where the front door is going etc and it's been it's been been a process My name is Steve Carlson. I, I manage construction for Paragon Commercial Group. I wanted to address the elevation a little bit further. The, uh, the elevations you have before you, the main tower has a com composite material that we're using on the other tower elements, and it is contained in just about all of the uh, key elements uh, throughout the project. There are, also some, uh, there are also two metal types that we're using out there as accents. Uh, the plasters have different textures. Uh, some of the plaster in key areas is a Venetian finish, which is a steel trowel finish, uh, to give it a real hard look. And uh, so there is quite a bit into it. It doesn't really, the renderings don't give it that much uh, depth or read. And uh, we, think, we think it has quite a bit to it and it's similar or it's replicated throughout the site. Yeah, I, I actually, uh, I like the look. I think the look is 
is terrific and it blends extremely well. Erwin, you yes. did a great job on this project. I mean, from what it was two <coughs> years ago to where you are today, outstanding job. Great job on Ted working with you. I think you've really brought something special to Rancho Mirage. It is so special. I think there are things that we've, we want to see in the development that really make it special and bring people to it uh, for other reasons. Uh, rather than shopping, because it's the place to go. And there's a couple of things I'd just like to ask you about. And, uh, you know, these are kind of off the wall. But uh, I know you've, you've done a lot of other shopping centers. Yes. And uh, have you ever done a center with some sort of an architectural focus in the middle of the parking lot, like a clock tower? because we've got the, the great ability to bring in those two roads, one off of Highway 111 and one off of Mag Falls to come together right in the center of the project. And I think something like that would be unique for this area and unique for this type of development. And, and you know, I appreciate the comment. I think that there's, there's definitely areas that we've really focused on. The pedestrian connection from the bus stop all the way over to Building K. We spent a lot of time on that because, to me, that's a natural place for people to use that pedestrian connection and allow that co connectivity. Regarding the patios as well, um, we want to make them people places where people can sit and enjoy. But quite candidly, what, what I want is the outside seating to energize, but also to have uh, pedestrian access to the rest of the shops as well because that, that's, that's important. We are gonna be doing um, a, a specimen tree as well, which is gonna be a focal point near the main entrance um, across from Wells Fargo and Hobby Lobby. And I, I, I need to look as whether there's some other opportunities that we could do something to that effect. Um, we wanna make it a great place. I'm, I wanna make sure though that to, to get here, it's, it's a long process with the tenants in terms of parking, requirements, et cetera, and we've got a site plan that's, that's been approved. So um, um, I do believe there's some opportunities that we can figure out whether it's a piece of public art or a specimen tree or something that can um, um, add. Yeah, that'd be great. I think it would break up the parking lot a little bit and give you a, a better feel when you're there. And yes. you get a real experience in shopping. Yes. Last thing, Rancho Las Palmas Shopping Center. <laughs> what about changing ch shopping center to village or plaza or something that gives it a different feel than, uh, than Rancho Las Palmas Shopping Center? You, you know, it's funny you bring that up because we, we actually had a lot of discussion about the, the name and uh, whether it should be rebranded or not. And we spent a lot of time talking to, to different community members. And surprisingly, a lot of people said Rancho Las Palmas Shopping Center, you know, I've been going there for years. I love it. I want it revitalized. I want I want the new energy in there. And surprisingly, that that's that's a brand that's recognized within within the community. We thought about rebranding it, but I don't think it's 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 the right move. Maybe we need a new brand because it's a it's a new vision, it's a new development rather than the same old Rancho Las Palmas Shopping Center. I will definitely take in that into account and uh, <laughs> maybe get some ideas from uh, from various people as to what uh, what what would work. And it, and one thing I want to mention, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to say, you know, how hard we've worked because it's 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 a long process. I'm really happy to be here, but quite honestly, I would not be here without the help of everybody on my team, on the city's team on the community's team, on the tenant side as well. I mean, CVS, we've spent a lot of time working on, on something that's a win-win for them too. This is really a big deal for our city. It's a, a massive turnaround for that whole end of the, of the city and we appreciate what you're doing and, and your team too. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to compliment Erwin and his entire team. They have been excellent to work with, the cooperation, the flexibility, uh, the communication probably is as important as anything. And it's really been terrific. 
Richard, as other member of the subcommittee, has been extremely helpful. Uh, Randy and the city manager, the entire planning department, Bud. Jeremy has worked really hard on this project. Sean Smith, I can't say enough about as far as coordinating this is concerned. Sean did a, a great job. Uh, I know that Bruce has been very pleased from a construction standpoint of the planning because, you know, this is a 36-year-old center, and the impediment in the past has always been the ingress and egress and the lack of visibility from Highway 111. And with this, with this change, uh, for the first time, now you're going to have the accessibility and you're going to have the vision and a view corridor that has been lacking. Uh, and that's the reason, of course, that it's been a difficult project to lease in the past. So, uh, Irwin, you, you've all done an excellent job. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And I will I just make my comment also, because I, I have to commend you also, and, and you've done a lovely job, and it's a relief to everyone I know to have this finally moving. And if you should decide to change the name, certainly even the marketplace, the Las Palmas marketplace would be uh, a little bit catchy also. I love Richard's idea about having something put in the middle as a, a feature. Uh, because it is a very special place, and we take such great pride in what we have in Rancho Mirage, and we want it to be beautiful. And uh, in saying all that, I would just move back for one second, back to Steinmart, even though it meets with your approval. I think that the beauty of your shopping center is very important, and even when you look on pages uh, 23, 24, 25 in the big book, um, it, there, it's very unusual architecture, it's very attractive, and I think that it would be um, very desirable for the shopping center, for the tenants that surround the Steinmart, and for anyone approaching Steinmart to appreciate a, a more attractive look. And I think that architectural enhancements and upgrades really can be done very, very modestly and would really add a great deal to an existing building like that. So um, I would like to make that as a condition uh, to go into the record. Well, the only comment I can make about that is that has, already, that has gone through the ARB. They've, they've looked at that. And I know I have sat in on those meetings, and they feel that uh, the design is extremely attractive, the colors are attractive, and I, I personally uh, would not be inclined to make that kind of a recommendation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's why we have menus. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Yeah. Any further comments from the public? Seeing none, public comments are closed. I'd like to, uh, uh, Madam Mayor, I'd like to make uh, several motions, if I may. Okay, go right ahead. All right. Uh, the, uh, actually, I'll incorporate, I'll incorporate uh, this as, as four. Uh, the first motion will be for the City Council to adopt a categorical, categorical exemption exemption pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, Section 15302, Class 2B, replacement of a commercial structure with a new structure of substantially the same size, purpose, and capacity. Number two. I, I believe we're going to be doing this as individual. Okay. Uh, Okay, so why don't we go ahead and vote on number one. Uh, someone would second that? I'll second it. Okay. We have uh, a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion passes, 5-0. Carry on. Okay, the uh, second motion then will be 
as follows. I move to approve conditional use permit case number CUP14006. Um, with the 24-hour CVS condition recommended by the Planning Commission modified as follows. CVS shall be permitted a 24-hour drive-through and 24-hour operation. The City Council reserves the right to review the conditional use permit and modify hours of operation to protect surrounding land uses and mitigate impacts to public services. That would be the motion. And that would be subject to the content findings and conditions in the staff report. Correct. All right. Okay. Is, is there anything on the um, conditional use permit, which of these conditions is applicable to the conditional use permit and which are applicable to the major modification or the, mo or the major variance? What, what are we approving? with each one of these. Uh, Randy, can you explain that to us? Jeremy, the CUP and the major mod conditions are one in the same list, is that right? That's correct. Okay. So the CUP conditions are included with the major modification. So, and the major variance is what? The major variance is a separate, separate uh, With separate respect case. to what? With respect to the uh, setbacks for a couple of the buildings. Okay. So, so te this technically because you have one list of conditions for the CUP and the major mod, you should probably take number two and three together in one motion. Because those incorporate the conditions that we have in the, uh, right. in the report. All right, you, and then why don't we, um, why don't we expand the motion then <clears throat> to Approve mo major modification case number MOD, MOD 14011 uh, with the conditions recommended by the Planning Commission modified as follows. As part of the final development plan, the landscaping, trash, and recycling areas at the rear of the former Vons building shall be upgraded and the former Tuesday morning building shall be upgraded architecturally to be complementary to the shopping center uh, and comply with such other standards as required by the Sunline Transit Agency. Which is that you're talking there about uh, condition We're talking 23? about the bus stop. Right. You're talking about condition 23? Are you amending condition 23, or I'm, I'm not quite sure what's going on? No, I don't think. 10-4, condition 23, rec recommended by the Planning Commission. I believe he's amending that, as you suggested. He's amending 23 20, and 24, 23 for, and that 24. New, for that new streamlined language. Okay. Could you say that language again with respect to Sunline? Uh, uh, well, the language was essentially that um, it would comply with such other standards as required by the Sunline Transit Agency. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and that would be added to number 23. Ted, are you done with that motion? Or are you still doing the motion? <laughs> that, would, that would be the conclusion of that portion. Okay, so I'll, subject to the findings and, and blah, blah, conditions blah, of the okay. staff report, correct. Okay, I'll, I'll second that. Could you okay. uh, read, read the portion having to do with CVS? The what? CVS. CVS. Yes, the, the language with the CVS is the, is the following. It's, CVS shall be permitted a 24-hour drive-through and 24-hour operation. The City Council reserves the right to review the 
CUP and modify hours of operation to protect surrounding land uses and mitigate impacts to public services. Just one question on that. The statement about 24 hours of service, does that mean that the complete store is open 24 hours also in addition to the 24-hour <coughs> drive through can Yes. Be. Yeah. Pardon me? It can be. Yes. It doesn't have to be. The entire store would be open 24 hours. Okay. So are we saying we can change that? Or? Yeah, well, we, the city can al always has the right to change it. In other words, if, if there was a problem of any kind, if there was a disturbance of any kind, the city always reserves the right to go in and, and, and say, no, it, it, it has to be reduced. And it's CVS is aware of this? Yes. They know, they know that this can happen? Okay. It could happen. Yeah, okay. So there would be no, oops, we didn't know about this. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay. Satisfactory? Okay, so we have a motion and a second, but I would like to amend that by adding that Steinmart would make some architectural upgrades uh, to be reviewed and approved by staff. And if there's someone that would want to second that. I'll second that. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion, an amendment, and a second. Yeah, so, so those are going to be upgrades to the Steinmark building. Correct. Okay. Are we calling what the upgrades are, Iris? Or are I'm we just, sorry? Are we what just saying that? just upgrades like well, facial or yes. color? Or? Well, to add where there's a contrast, if you look on page 22 of the large book. Yeah, I see. I know what you mean. That, yeah. That it's just the, the contrast in paints. I see. I hear you. Colors. Yeah. So something, I mean, there could be some little architectural uh, enhancements that could be made. And uh, just to make it a little bit more attractive and look, make it look more like like uh, Rancho Mirage and like, you know, the, up, the upgrades of the other buildings. I'd like to ask the applicant to come back up and make <coughs> comment about that before I okay. agree to add that as a condition. Okay. Okay. The public hearing is open again. Okay, and we have Erwin Busey here. Busey, yes, and also Steve Carlson. And Steve, maybe, maybe I'd like Steve to just reiterate uh, the, in other words, the, the different finishes that are being used, the different, um, so I'll let him address that. Yes, the, uh, the components or the elements of the elevation for the Steinmark are similar to those elements used in all the other tenant buildings. Uh, there are different composition, or there are compositions of the same uh, different materials. It's not just a single material. There are metals. There are a composite material, which is a theme material that we're using on all of the towers. And there is uh, a Corten steel, which is one of the metal finishes that's being used. And that is consistent with all of the buildings within. So if there's a specific upgrade to the Steinmark building, we'd like it to be consistent with the other buildings to the extent we can and not introduce something foreign to that particular building. <coughs> Wouldn't it throw off the, the whole look if, if, this, if that building were changed or different mm -hmm. colors added? Well, again, that, that would it, be the problem, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, there's, there's a yeah. uniform theme through the architecture. It's going, a very yeah. contemporary architecture. Uh, the, the design was intentional because <coughs> we wanted to move away from the appearance the center has now, which is kind of old and it also is unsuccessful now. And we want to completely change that look so that when people return to the center in its new state, they'll completely forget about the old center and what it was all about. And so that's, we were careful in choosing this particular palette of materials. And again, I think that particular flat elevation doesn't really uh, give you the sense of all the different texture that's in, in the different components of that element, but it's the same on the other buildings as well. So all of those buildings have the same different materials in various styles and shapes on there. There's a lot of similarity to the uh, Gene Autry Plaza in Palm Springs, so I can see the similarity here, and that works well over there. The architect putting this together did a lot of research of the architecture in the valley, yeah. and we had a lot of image boards that we looked at to try and bring in some of those desert looks. Uh, well, 
making this a distinguished look. We really wanted it to be something that separated it from the river yeah. and clearly separated from what it looks like today. Yeah, well, I personally couldn't see how one building could could be have a different look than all of the other buildings in the center. The whole idea is that you're creating a, a symmetry here and you're, you're, you have a design look and colors consistent throughout the project. And that, I think that's the appealing part from a personal standpoint. And I would agree with you. And I think that in order to really um, make everyone comfortable here, we can take a five minute break and uh, take a look at some of these renderings and see if we can come to some kind of agreement on how uh, the Steinmart building may be able to take on uh, more of a look of some of the other buildings that are being newly constructed. So why don't we take a 10 minute break here and we'll come okay. back. Well, where are we um, on the other motions at this point? Well, that motion is on hold right now because it included two and three. Uh, but we have... And you have a, a, a motion and you have a second. And then there was, I made an amendment and Richard seconded that. So and we have not voted on anything yet regarding number two and number three on page 10 one. Well, the... So the, why don't we just take a break and we'll, we'll discuss it a little bit and then come back. Okay, we are reopening and coming back uh, our, from our recess, and uh, Tim now is going we, to take it from here. Yeah, we've redone the motion. Um, Randy, you want to read the, the change that we just made. Uh, start from uh, the beginning of the motion, and we'll incorporate two and three with the change. Okay, thank you. So two, and, two stays mm -hmm. the same, which is all the language for the conditional use permit and the 24-hour operation, and three would be modified as follows. Move to approve major modification, case number MOD 14011, based upon the content findings and conditions in the staff report with the conditions recommended by the Planning Commission modified as follows. As part of the final development plan, the landscaping, trash, and recycling areas at the rear of the former Vons building shall be upgraded, and the former Tuesday morning building and Steinmart shall be upgraded architecturally to be complementary to the shopping center to the satisfaction of staff, and to amend condition number three to, to say, and comply with other such standards as required by the Sunline Transit Agency, period. Okay, that is our motion. Uh, Richard, I believe you seconded it. Yes, okay. you, you had a different motion. That in, that's now included. Yeah, we, we combined, well, that we combined that, motion. Let's find out if Richard yeah. seconds it. <laughs> yes. You second it again? Well, I, what's the position on it right now? You, well, you made a motion, I second, and we adjourn. Right. Okay. And then Randy and just read. Go so ahead, they've modified the motion. We modified so the motion. Incorporating the mayor's their motion into what? What, what Randy said. just read. Yes. Right. God. Okay. I I'll second that. Okay. okay. All right. Please cast your vote. And the motion carries five zero. Okay. Moving on to item four on that. Okay, and, and, and the motion for item four will be, <clears throat> I move that the city approve major variance case number VA 414004 based upon the content findings and conditions in the staff report. And I will second. Please vote. Motion carries five. Zero. Thank you all so much. And uh, thank you all so much for all your hard work and all your patience <clears throat> and, and working so well with staff. Uh, we're looking so forward to the grand opening. And, but first, we're looking forward to the uh, shovel in the ground. We're, we appreciate it, help, and, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to it, too. Um, I wish I could say that the, the, 
the work's over, but the work has just begun. It is, and yeah. we're excited about it. And uh, thanks again for, for the opportunity <clears throat> to be here. You are welcome. But at least the growing pains are over. <laughs> well, the, this, the, city will, the city will be very proud of this project. Absolutely. I, I feel quite certain about it. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you again. All right. Madam Thanks. Mayor, I can just make a comment. I wanted to thank uh, Councilman Weil for helping us through this project from start to finish, working with the developer, working with staff and the subcommittee. Thank you very much. Here, here. You're welcome. You all deserve yeah. quite a hand. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Can we move on to number 13 as we have the chamber executive director yes. is what here. Yes, what is idea. Go to 11, please. All right, we will move on to number 13. Well, okay. doesn't, number, doesn't number 11 kind of play <coughs> along with uh, number 10? Well, it does. It does. Well, we have, we have a conflict. Samantha, who's the director of the chamber, uh, has to leave, Science. and she wants to make a little, little thank you to us before she goes. Okay. On number 13. Uh, are we switching or going yes. ahead? Yes, we're we're just 13, then we'll back to 11. Right. You go back to 11 or so. Yeah. Right, and this is going to be uh, presented by Joseph Carpenter, our economic development analyst, and Sean Smith. Sean's going to be in the audience directing. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. I'll be very brief today. Uh, on November 3rd, 2011, the city council adopted resolution number 2011-39, <coughs> through which it approved the surplus personal property policy. Section 3, paragraph 2 of this policy reads in part that if any department head determines that any personal property of the city valued at over $500 or more is not needed, that the department head shall notify the city manager that such personal property is deemed surplus. Such, personal, such surplus personal property, however, must be deemed to be officially surplus by the city council via resolution prior to its disposal pursuant to the provisions set forth in the policy. Furthermore, Section 4, Subsection C of the Surplus Personal <coughs> Property Policy permits the City Council to dispose of surplus personal property utilizing a variety of methods including donation to a nonprofit in good standing with all applicable laws and regulation that serves the community of Ranch Mirage. During the Chamber of Commerce Subcommittee meeting on October 8, 2014, the subcommittee consisting of Mayor Smotrich and Councilmember Townsend stated they would support the furniture currently being used by the Chamber of Commerce being deemed surplus and the city donating the furniture to the chamber to aid in their relocation efforts. Found on pages 13-7 through 13-10 of your agenda and currently displayed on your screen, the personal property requested to be deemed surplus consists of seven non-rolling chairs in varying styles, 17 rolling chairs in varying styles, two U-shaped desks, three work desks, six rectangular tables, and one small table. After consulting with multiple division managers as well as the directors of public works and administrative services, it was determined that these items will be of no use to the city. Therefore, with the support of the Chamber of Commerce Subcommittee, staff recommends that the City Council adopt a resolution declaring the listed items surplus and approved disposition by way of donation to the Chamber of Commerce. At this time, I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Joseph. Any questions or comments? I think that um, City Attorney might want to remind us that in none of these categories does any member of the City Council qualify as a person who can receive any of this discarded uh, or <coughs> surplus uh, equipment, including our own equipment that we might be using, maybe iPads or iPhones or chairs or any of that. So I just want to stop us drooling from uh, the early well, before we get too far. Well, Mr. Townsend was wondering if he could be selling some of this in his store. <laughs> now I can't. <laughs> okay. Steve, did you want to have um, a That's true, with the exception of the city attorney. <laughs> no, yeah, but um, none of the, none of the um, city council members are allowed to be the recipient of any of the surplus, these surplus items. Okay. Okay. So there. <coughs> so so there. there. So okay. give it back? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other comments or questions? That's a lot any, of good stuff. Yeah. yeah there is. Any comments or questions from the uh, audience? 
All right. Oh, we do have someone. Here comes, Here comes Samantha. We have a bidder. Here is Samantha, and she is our esteemed uh, director of our Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Madam Mayor, City Council, and staff. Um, I just wanted to thank you for taking the time for considering uh, the donation of the furniture to us. It will definitely help in our transition. We are moving November 24th. So if we can load up the moving trucks then with your decision today, that would be fantastic. So thanks for that. And we hope you come visit us at our new location. Where's you your new questions? location? Our new location is 71905 Highway 111. And we will be sharing the parking space with Lamps Plus and Perch. So we're just the office building directly behind them. Okay, good luck. Thank you. Thanks. Congratulations. Thank you. It's a thanks. wonderful new a location. We and wish I would like to say thank you to uh, Charles Townsend and Madam Mayor and Joseph and Sean Smith for the assistance over the past few months in locating somewhere that's appropriate for the chamber to Good. move forward into and to grow into. So thanks for that. And I'm Good. sure you will grow. And congratulations again. <clears throat> thank you. Okay. Uh, I will make the motion, if I may. Thank you that the City Council adopt Resolution 2014, declaring the items listed in the staff report surplus and approving disposi disposition by way of donation to the Chamber of Commerce in accordance with Resolution 2011-39, which approved the surplus personnel property policy. Okay, may I have a second? Second. Okay, please vote. Motion carries 5-0, and thank you so much, Joseph, and thank you, Samantha. All the best. All right, going back to item number 11, and this is something that is going to be handled again by Jeremy Klein, Planning Technician. Thank you again, Madam Mayor. Um, so for your consideration, our zoning text amendment case number ZTA 14001, and signed program case number SIRP14001. Again, the site uh, is located at the northeast corner of Highway 111 and Bob Hope Drive. This is a signed program for the Rancho Las Palmas Shopping Center. A zoning text amendment was submitted as part of the entitlement package for the purpose of allowing more flexibility in the development of sign programs when proposed in conjunction with large scale comprehensively planned commercial projects. A large scale commercial development is defined as being greater than 15 acres in size. The amendment seeks to add language to section 17.28.100 of the Rancho Mirage Municipal Code, the title of that section being sign program. Currently the development of sign programs must adhere to the development standards that are listed within Table 3-13 of Section 17.28.150 of the Rancho Mirage Municipal Code. Staff believes that by allowing large-scale commercial projects to develop sign programs which may exceed the limits imposed by the aforementioned table, an applicant would be able to create unique sign programs that align with the design characteristics of the, the, the design characteristics and themes of their respective shopping centers and at the same time maintain the goals and policies that are listed in the community design element of the city's general plan. Um, and basically the way the, the ZTA would work, um, it, would, it would give the following exceptions. Um, exceptions to the standard requirements will only be considered if the following conditions are met. Number one, the shopping center shall provide prove to be superior in architectural and landscape design. Number two, the quality of signage shall be superior in design and construction quality and appropriate in context and scale for the proposed application. And number three, a, de a detailed written analysis shall be submitted for all signs that are proposed to exceed the standard requirements. Um, the proposed ordinance has been attached to the staff report. At this point, I'd like to briefly describe each of the proposed monument signs and then show a site plan so that you can see where each of the signs will be located. Hmm. This slide displays the center identification monument. The maximum height of this monument sign is four feet seven inches tall. Um, and then all of the monument signs will be constructed of materials that correspond directly to the shopping center itself. 
such as the core 10 steel and the cultured stone. This slide shows the two panel tenant design, which extends to a maximum height of seven feet. It allows um, all of these signs as well are double sided. So you would have two, two tenant panel signs on each side of the, uh, the structure. Here you can see the three panel design, which reaches a maximum height of eight feet, seven inches. And lastly, this is the five panel tenant design, um, which would extend to a maximum height of 11 feet, nine inches. So the site plan shows the location of each of the proposed monuments. Staff has recommended and the planning commission um, has uh, agreed to the recommendation that four of the proposed signs should be revised. Uh, starting with the sign labeled as number one, um, a three panel tenant monument is proposed at this location. However, staff feels that this sign should be restricted to center identification only. And the concern here is that the, uh, due to the orientation and height of this sign, um, it will prevent motorists from seeing oncoming traffic uh, that travel northbound on Bob Hope Drive as they try to exit the center. So just real quickly here. So at the new, at the new intersection here, as a, as a vehicle approaches the intersection to make a right, uh, for instance, on a red light, the orientation of the sign being perpendicular to the road will prevent them from seeing oncoming traffic. And as you can see at the other locations, at the other intersections, the signs have been um, restricted to tenor, tenant identification and they've been oriented parallel to the roadway so that, so that folks can see right past the signs and see traffic coming. It's the same situation that was done here. So that's why staff is recommending removal of the three panel and installation of a tenant ID sign at this location. Also the tenant ID sign only reaches a height of four foot seven inches. So even if it was oriented this way, um, motorists would be able to peer over the sign and see vehicles coming towards them. Um, signs two and four as listed um, are the five panel design. Staff feels that the height of these signs is excessive and has rec recommended that they be um, revised to the three panel design and that no five panel designs should be permitted um, as part of the project. And by, by revising them to the three panel design, you would be shortening each of those signs by a little more than three feet. And then finally, uh, the sign identified as number three, which is located at the corner of Bob Hope Drive and Highway 111. There are two signs proposed at that location, a center identification monument and a three panel tenant monument sign. Staff has recommended that the three panel tenant monument sign be eliminated and that this corner be strictly, um, um, well, that the center ID be used at this location just because of the prominence of this intersection. And in regards to the building wall signage, staff is happy with all of the proposed signs with the exception of two, two instances. So I'll just briefly describe those. Um, number one, staff is recommending that the CVS pharmacy sign on the east elevation be restricted to 42 inches in height as opposed to the 54 inch letters that are proposed. And here you can see that the, the image on the bottom, north elevation, which, which is right here. So the north elevation faces into the project site and really can't be seen from the, the, the streets. Um, staff is okay with a 54 inch height at this location for the CVS portion of the CVS pharmacy sign. But on the east elevation, which will be seen from motorists traveling on Highway 111, Staff has recommended that that be limited to 42 uh, for a couple reasons. Number one, if, if you look back to the, the uh, image on the bottom, the fascia on this is quite large and even a 54 inch sign sits comfortably within that fascia. Whereas on this elevation, you can see that the uh, fascia is considerably smaller and by simply maintaining the same aspect ratio of signage to fascia, 
this would shrink down to 42 inches, which would be consistent with the existing CVS sign that currently exists on the, uh, on the building now, which is much farther away from uh, the road. So that's one of the, the items. And then number two has to do with the tenant signs on the west side of building N. Staff has recommended that these signs be limited to 18 inches in height, uh, mostly so that a distinct hierarchy of signage can be established here. The letter heights on the tower feature are 24 inches in height, and they will be used for tenor, tenant identification purposes, and those are right here. So staff has basically recommended that these be um, 18 inches in height to create a hierarchy. And one of the other reasons is that it falls in line with the, with the other, with building K. So the south elevation of building K, which faces Highway 111, has the same situation. It has 24 inch letters on the circular tower feature. And then it's proposed to have 18 inch letters for the tenant sign on that <coughs> location. So staff is just simply requesting that uh, the applicant mimic that condition. Um, so that building N and building K would be uh, consistent. And that basically concludes the presentation. I do have exhibits for each of the individual buildings if council wishes to see them. But again, no additional changes were recommended by staff nor the planning commission. Um, so with that, based on the content, findings, and conditions of the staff report, the planning commission recommends approval of this project. Um, and just as a, as a side note, I wanted to mention that after the planning commission, the applicant did submit a revised sign program for the CVS building, which basically adheres to everything that the planning commission recommended. Um, and I know the applicant wanted to discuss that. There was just one remaining item that uh, was to be discussed in that regard, and it had to deal with ancillary signage, not the main uh, building signage. So they have revised that since the planning commission meeting. And uh, with that, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So CVS is happy with the 42 inches on that one face? That's correct. Okay, that's great. So essentially, um, all of the recommendations that planning has made has been agreed to by applicant with possibly one thing that's going to be discussed by the applicant. Is that accurate? That's for the CVS building itself. As far as the monument sign discussion, I, I'm unaware. Okay, any other questions from council? Any questions from the audience? Okay, public, public hearing is now closed. Or do you want, okay, did you want to come up and, good. You're gonna to speak to us again. Thanks again, Erwin Busey, Paragon Commercial Group. Uh, there's, there's a couple issues that I want to bring up and discuss. One is I need a minimum of 24 inches letters for, um, for um, not only Building K, but uh, the building, the old bank building on Bob Hope. It, that is just standard in the industry to have, that is a minimum. Um, so I would, I would like that. What are I, you recommending now, Erwin? Well, it, it was staff recommended 18 inches, and it's uh, that I haven't seen 18 inches, and I've been doing this 25 years for for a long time, and and so I, I would respectfully request 24 inches on that. Um, can you pull uh, Sarah, up? Sarah, yeah. Can you pull up that that would show that on the screen? How many locations do we have that situation? Just two. Just two locations. Yeah. yeah. And would that meet the same ratio for, between the facade and the actual lettering as the other buildings? Good question. Um, I don't have the answer to that, but I, we can make sure that we've got an element that, so, it, so it's scaled and it, it looks correct, but it's just from a tenant standpoint and attracting quality tenants, they are going to want 24 inches. Okay. 
I mean, basically, you're talking about a six-inch difference. Is that correct? That is correct. What has to be amended here? Well, that's a good question because while the text of the staff report talks about 24-inch letters <coughs> going down to 18-inch letters, there's actually no condition of approval that requires that. Is that right, Jeremy? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so it was a discussion in the text of the report, which I think Irwin is addressing, but there is no condition to amend to change it back to 24. Can we add that condition now? You don't need to. It's so they, since 24. they're not conditioned anyway, they can go to 24? Right. Well, Fine. the only thing I might add, just real quick, on Building K, their proposal is an 18-inch letter. So are they proposing to amend that as well? Yes. Oh, that, so you're asking a condition to be added then? Well, I, and my mistake, I apologize, but I missed that. That should be 24 inches. So, my mistake. Okay. So, so, so the kit. If the council agrees, you would add a condition that says letter height for the signage on building K um, shall be a maximum of 24 inch letters. No, no less than 24. Or inch. Yeah, minimum 24 inch letters. No, yeah. not a minimum. Well, he's asking for 24, 24 inches. 24 inches. Yeah, shall listen, be 24 get inch two, letters. We don't want to give him a chance to go to seven feet. <laughs> <laughs> Then I, I would like to sp just spend a couple seconds on the monument signs, too. Uh, after recommendation to go from a five-panel sign, which was 11 feet 6 inches, to a three-panel sign, um, one of the reasons that I want a four-panel sign is I already have three majors, which is Hobby Lobby, Stein Martin, CVS, which are going to occupy both sides of those three, three monument signs. But I also have, I'm in leases with a grocer for 10,000 square feet. They need some representation on, on a monument sign. So I am requesting that uh, the five panel monument signs be reduced to a four panel monument sign with a maximum height of eight feet, six inches. What about reducing the sign of the, the size of the lettering so you can keep it the same height as the three panel but do four panels? I think that's a little tough because I have exhibits in my leases already. So, okay. but you are going from five to four, correct? And I will limit the height to eight feet six inches, eight, and we will work with staff to make <laughs> sure that the base is compatible and, and works. Okay, Good. As, as it, go ahead. I was going to make a suggestion that perhaps it, when Richard asked about the lettering reduction in size, um, would there be any chance if you did have a four panel sign that you could reduce the uh, base in height? And, and that's what we did. I, I actually submitted a, a drawing uh, to staff which reduced the overall base to get it to the eight foot five, uh, six inches and we reduced the base. There was some discussion as the allocation of, of uh, the clad stone versus the Cortine steel, and so we'd work that out with staff, um, but that, that's important. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is Brandini is, is, is going to be taking the Tuesday morning space. They're in the back of the shopping center. It's critical because the, the, there is no identity. It is critical that I have some type of signage on Bob Hope for them. Um, the center identification sign that staff proposed on um, M3, I would propose that to be a two-panel sign, and the height and, and width would be subject, and placement would be subject to staff's approval. Um, I think it's really important to have signage for Brandini. Brandini is an important tenant within the community, and uh, we want them to be as successful as possible. So yeah, you're Grant. proposing a two-panel for Brandini? Yeah, I proposed a two-panel. And then the last thing I want to bring up, and I apologize, but CVS also, it's great. They agreed to the 42 inches, but we have just a couple clarifications because the word pharmacy, the Y, is because of the tail. So Rosalia was here to, to just discuss that. Just have to cut off the tail there, when <laughs> that's all there is to it. Pharmacist. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, Madam, and City Council members, uh, staff. Uh, thank you for having us. 
Uh, my name is Rosalio Arellanes, and I'm a development manager from Bose Development. We are a preferred developer for uh, national retail companies in Southern California. Uh, there's a couple of technicalities, and we just wanted to clear those up before we uh, essentially sign up on the conditions. Uh, the f as you know, we uh, agreed to uh, reduce the size of the sign and the east elevation to 42 inches. Uh, however, in the conditions, there was a uh, provision in there that basically limit us to 200 square feet on the front elevation. And if we follow that condition, we are going to have to eliminate yet another uh, auxiliary sign on the south elevation. Um, I can point to it, but essentially we're going to get rid of that sign. It's not going to be allowed. Um, We'd have maybe to have they it can on. they We'd can have point to, have to it, it on the screen. There you go. Yeah, I think we can. Sarah can bring it up. Go ahead. So uh, maybe I'll move on to the second item. Uh, second item, I, said, I think, is a technicality, and the conditions. Uh, the sign that is 54 inches, uh, the war pharmacy, uh, they limit that height to be 36 inches. But if you look at the ascendant and descendant letters, it's actually 42. So we don't know if that actually was part of the condition or we obviously can't change the sign itself because otherwise it'll modify the logo, which has you know marketing implications. So we just want to modify that, maybe those words and the condition to be 42 inches rather than 36. I think. Um, the planner were looking at the words like, far, like M and A, which are 32, but not took into consideration the Y and the P. So it's just a technicality. I don't, I don't know if it makes uh, a difference. We have the exhibit coming up, so if you want to. Okay. okay. Thank you. So if you go to the last page, so we can follow up on the last item that I was talking about. So if, as you see, the, the condition is to have the war pharmacy to be only 36 inches. But if you include the Y and the uh, H, that's going to be a 42-inch height. So I'm not, again, it's just technicality. I'm not sure if it makes any uh, difference. Yes, Randy. Uh, Madam Mayor, you don't need to modify a condition of approval. It goes without saying that the bottom of the Y, just like the top of the H, would be allowed in a 36-inch tall letter. Now you have it orally. And then uh, if you go back to one page. So the drive-through sign that you see there, uh, if we follow the conditions, that area right now is 133 square feet. We are allowed per the conditions only a maximum of 100 square feet. So the uh, drive-through sign is important because uh, it's the only way to basically tell people driving in Highway 111 that this particular store is a drive-through store. So we want to modify the condition to essentially say uh, with the square foot area to be 133 rather than 100 square feet. Are you talking about all the signs combined, or can you point out which sign you're talking about? The drive-through sign. Let's see, the green sign to the left, the far left, the south elevation. They, they, there's a limit of, of 100 uh, square feet, and they've got a total of 133. So all they're asking is to make sure that they can have that drive-through sign because it's such an important part of the mm -hmm. Jeremy, what so, condition of approval are we specifically talking about here? If you could just interject, provide some focus. If you look at the nor uh, north elevation, it sets a specific amount of square footage allowed for the whole elevation. Rosario, are you lasering the wall over there? I, <laughs> no, it's a different. I'm doing that. <laughs> Somebody's playing with something. Yeah. So this, this is a sign that we want to keep. So if you include all of these signs, it basically adds up to 133. The maximum allow is a 100. So we essentially want to modify that condition to say 133. Okay, hold that thought. Jeremy, what condition number is it? So if you refer to, to page 11-19, um, the first two lines are B and C, and he would be referring to C. The total of all signage on the south and west elevation shall not exceed 100 square feet. Okay, so if the council is inclined to go 133, that's where it would be put. And it's 133.61, so we might want to round up to 134. Oh, you're pushing it. Around. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I know I know CVS is not happy with the with the 42, but we're at 42, and I, that that took a lot of effort. Thank you. Now we that was a compromise. We appreciate it, Matt. 
I know that uh, you worked hard for that compromise. Okay. So. Okay, can we Randy, have a motion? Just, see where we are here. Yeah, Randy, why don't you explain where we, we are? We have a motion or an e-motion? So, a little both. I think you can go ahead and close the hearing, and if we have a motion, then we can get clarification that way. Okay, so the public hearing, if there are no more people wishing to speak, the public hearing is now closed. And uh, would someone like to make a motion? Okay. Do Randy, you want to change? <coughs> We've cross-pollinized here about three or four times. All right. Well, you have three recommendations. So the first recommendation has to do with CEQA. Okay. And so your first recommendation would be that, uh, what is it, a uh, exemption, CEQA exemption be filed per section 15061. B paren three. Yeah, exactly. And you need a second now. Okay. Second. I'll well, I'll make Richard. the motion in. Yeah. Okay. Richard seconds. Okay. Okay. Please vote. Motion carries five zero. Thank you. All right. Moving on to number two. Well, the uh, the second motion would be that the council adopt the uh, attached ordinate amendment pursuant to case number ZTA 14001, amending Title 17, Section 17.28.100 of the Rancho Mirage Municipal Code to allow comprehensively planned commercial developments of 15 acres or more to propose sign programs which are not restricted by the development standards listed in tables 3-13 of section 17.28.150 paren signs allowed by type of development and zoning district. I'll second that. All right. Is there any discussion on that item? Seeing none. Okay, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Moving on to item number three on that page. Okay. Are, are we deleting this now? No, we're going to modify it tonight, as suggested. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I think Councilman Weil is looking to move that the sign program be approved subject to the conditions and findings in the staff report, modifying condition number four to state the tenant monument sign proposed at the newly intersized, inter, the newly signalized intersection at the project's northern extent shall be replaced with a two panel monument sign and moved to the northern corner. And then condition number seven be modified to say a total of four tenant identification monument signs shall be permitted, two of which shall be four panel designs and two of which shall be two panel designs. So the only change there is three panel to change to four panel. And then add a condition that building K be allowed 24 inch letter height for tenant signage. I think that's it. Okay. Did you say we were changing the five panel to four panel? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And that's well, where they were going. Well, to the lower condition the says five panel to three panel, but Councilman Wiles' motion is to change the three panel oh. to four panel. It's a compromise between the two. Right. Okay. All right. And I believe I second it. Oh, one. I'm sorry to interrupt, but. Um, it was also for building N to upgrade the letter heights on building N to 24 inches oh. and also to allow the 133 square foot for uh, the CBS. Very okay. good. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. So we'll include that also. And please vote. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you all. And thank you. Erwin, how, uh, how wide is that eight-foot sign? Is that eight-foot by eight-foot? Uh, uh, the sign's not the eight-foot uh, height overall. 
Erwin, can you can you talk a little louder and turn on your microphone? Thanks, Dan. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, moving on to the action items. First will be number 12, and that will be presented by our city attorney, Stephen B. Cantanea. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, in October of 2013, Governor Brown signed a law, as known as Senate Bill Number 7, and that law was adopted with the intent of encouraging or providing a financial incentive for charter cities to pay prevailing wages for public works construction projects. Um, six charter cities um, filed a lawsuit against the state, and we had anticipated that these six charter cities were going to receive, or um, there was gonna be a restraining order issued that would prevent a particular part of the law from taking effect January 1st, 2015. Unfortunately, they were unsuccessful, so a number of charter cities have been rushing to comply with Senate Bill Number 7. What Senate Bill Number 7 requires is that it requires that charter cities that wish to continue receiving um, any grant money for construction projects to adopt an ordinance that repeals any provision it has, the charter city has as an, in its municipal code or <laughs> charter that exempts itself from payment of prevailing wages, and to also adopt provisions that require that the city pay prevailing wages for construction activities that exceed $25,000 or more, and to pay prevailing wages that involve public works construction projects um, with respect to any alteration, demolition, repair, or maintenance activities. So with that said, what you have to before you is an ordinance that proposes to do exactly that. And exempt from this, um, so if this is adopted um, before January 1st, 2015, the city will be eligible to continue receiving um, state grants for public works construction projects. Now, any project that was awarded or involved construction activities associated with contracts that were awarded um, prior to January 1st, 2015 are exempt from the payment of prevailing wages. So we do have some existing contracts that are subject to amendments, and it's my determination, I rendered a legal opinion that those are exempt. So even though we'll be amending those, it's like there's a high likelihood we'll be amending those to continue them for an additional term, those should be exempt from the payment of prevailing wages. So my recommendation is that the council introduce this ordinance. Okay. And adopt it. Thank you, Steve. All right, any questions from council? Any questions from the public? Seeing none, we will close the I public. move that we um, adopt the ordinance that repeals Ranch Mars Municipal Code Section 3.34.100 that exempts a locally funded public works projects from the payment of prevailing wages and adds new RMMC Section 3.34.105 to impose prevailing wage requirements on certain locally funded public works projects. Okay, and I will second that. Please vote. Motion carries 4-0 with one person who has left the dais temporarily. So moving on to item number 13. Madam Mayor, before we you get to that. Um, we did 13. We did number 13. We did 13, yeah. We're moving on to number 14. Number 14. While Isaiah's putting together his pie charts, yes. uh, oh. just make, make an announcement that uh, Bruce Harry's staff, uh, Bill Harrison, the signal technician, has already changed the left green arrow at Los Alamos and Gerald Ford. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, That was quick. Bruce. That was quick. Wow. Okay. It's supposed to show how long your meetings are. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Isaiah is going to present this. He is our finance director. And take it, Isaiah. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, the purpose of the staff report is really twofold. One, to uh, share the good news with the Council on the results of fiscal year 13-14, and in addition to request some cleanup budget adjustments that we need for 13-14 to uh, comply with our budget policy. Twice annually, the City Manager leads a review of our budget, uh, once at the mid-year, so halfway through our fiscal year, and then again, at the uh, year end, and this is uh, the result of the city manager's review of the year end numbers. So I'm gonna focus most of my presentation on page 14-2. On page 14-2, I have a chart right in the middle of the page that is titled Fiscal Year 1314 Summary. And uh, this shows you the progression uh, starting from uh, the left column. That was our original bu budget. So when we first adopted our two-year budget, that's where the original amount was. Based on the mid-year review, that is the middle column titled amended budget. And then the far right column where I'm gonna be speaking to is our actual results for 1314. So in the top half of the graph, you'll see that our operating surplus for 1314 was $2,940,255. Uh, that is a significant increase from the amended budget, which was projecting just above $300,000. Really the driver uh, of this difference was our operating revenues uh, exceeded revenue projections by 1.6 million. And the driver behind that was a nice increase in our TOT taxes, our sales tax, and the interest income on the city's investments. Everything else was really just due to the conservative budget, budgeting practice of the city where uh, numerous other general fund revenues came in just above budgeted amounts. We always budget revenues a little conservative. Uh, and so that was a result of uh, just actuals coming in a little higher uh, than what we were projecting for numerous other accounts. On the uh, operating expenditure side, uh, we came in under budgeted expenditures by approximately $1 million. And uh, the two drivers of that was the fire tax fund did not require a subsidy from our general fund. And there was uh, lower than expected uh, participation in the vacation buyback program. And then the remaining of the difference again is due to our conservative, conservative budgeting practices where uh, actuals came in just a bit under what we budgeted for operating expenditures. So that is the result of why you see a great operating surplus. And the operating surplus really gives the council a picture of our main operations and how stable our city is. Uh, if you were to see Deficits, deficits in this number, uh, we would have a structural problem. So being that we have a $2.9 million surplus, uh, it shows the strength of the city. Uh, the bottom half of the graph focuses on these non-operating activities. Uh, non-operating revenue is really uh, mostly made up of grants. Those are non-routine and really reimburse uh, expenditures on capital projects for when we have grants. Uh, the non-operating expenditure side is where you'll see a, a significant difference um, from budget, the amended budget. There's about a $10 million difference to where we actually ended, and that was simply due just to a delay in certain projects, which I've identified in the staff report. The significant projects that were uh, delayed, just a timing difference, was the spa suite purchase of $5 million. We were projecting in the budget 2.125 million for section 19 water improvements. Uh, we didn't have any expenditures under that project. And uh, there were about 2.5 million in various other street related projects that got pushed into 1415, which made up that, that big difference. An attachment to the staff report in attachment A is the listing of all the budget adjustments. Again, these are uh, more in line with just procedural items to comply with our budget policy. So the full listing is noted in attachment A to the staff report. And then attachment B gives you the detail on every other fund the city has. And with that, that concludes my presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Isaiah. Lovely report. Thank you, thank you. Great Any job, comments? Isaiah. <coughs> yes, sir. Thank you.
You can come back for 1415, okay? Yeah. Oh, and uh, I uh, did fail to mention uh, we did meet uh, with the Budget Subcommittee, which is Mayor Pro Tem Hobart and Councilman Kite, and uh, they reviewed all this in detail. I uh, kept their time for about two and a half hours, so I definitely appreciate your guys' time through this process. Yeah, you better remember that. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Richard, did you have to ask for that compliment? <laughs> yes, I did. Okay. So, moving along here, is that um, someone make an, a motion to, or do we need a motion I'll to accept with, all uh, this? Council approve and adopt the tax resolution mm. number 2014, next in order, amending the fiscal year 2013-14 budget. I also recommend, we don't have to do those separately. Well, I'll also recommend that the board of directors of the City of Rancho Mirage Housing Authority approve and adopt the attached resolution number 2014 HA next in order amending the fiscal year 2013 to 14 budget. Next, I would move that uh, the Board uh, of Directors of the City of Rancho Mirage Public Library approve and adopt the attached resolution number 2014 LB next in order amending the fiscal year 2013-2014 budget, and finally, that the Board of Directors of the City of Rancho Mirage Community Services Direct District approve and adopt the attached resolution number 2014 CSD, next in order, amending the fiscal year 2013-14 budget. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Good job, Dan. Motion carries 5 0. All right, moving on to item number 15. <coughs> and this is our last item, and it'll be presented by David Bryant, our also esteemed uh, library director. Mayor Smotrich, members of the library board, I bring before you the request to um, close the library to the public <clears throat> on the following days, January 21st, 22nd, 23rd, and 24th of 2015. This to allow us to fully utilize the building, setting up three distinct um, programming areas for our annual Writers Fest. This will be the second year of the festival. We've sold 740 tickets to date. We think that staff and the rental company we are buying, uh, we're renting, uh, lunch and furniture from really can best utilize the campus if we are shut to the public those days. I would add, however, that is 1.3% of our current library year and the library will remain open online and via telephone. So we certainly will continue to pr provide service. All of our databases will be accessible. So we'll very much be there to support information research, but we think that to really utilize the facility as we need to to set up properly for this major event, Second Annual Writers Fest. We would appreciate your approving closing those four days. Thank you, David. Any questions or comments from Council? Nope. Any questions or comments from the audience? Okay. Public comments closed. And if I can have a motion. I will do a motion that we, Library Board, approve closing the Rancho Mirage Public Library from Wednesday, January 21st through Saturday, January 24th, 2015, to provide fuller use of the library building and campus for the 750 plus ticket holders for this exciting <coughs> event on the city's calendar. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much for attending, and we look forward to seeing you next time, and just have a wonderful evening. And we appreciate so many people staying through the whole yes. program. Yes, thank you. Yes. <laughs> hey, Tom. Wait, we have to we adjourn, adjourn the closed session. Oh, we have to recess oh, we... into closed session. Recess this is closed my session. part. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, this is my okay. thing. We're going okay. into closed. Oh, we have to reopen again, <laughs> and we'll oh, hear from Steve. From Steve uh, Quintanilla regarding our closed session. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The City Council and the Housing Authority Board is now going to recess at the closed session pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9 regarding the pending case of Veronica Juarez versus City of Rancho Mirage. 
Council will also um, recess into closed session to consider anticipated litigation um, pursuant to 54956.9 of the California Government Code and the facts and circumstances involved the receipt of a subpoena regarding a case in which the city is not a named party. That's okay. it. Thank you for your report. And now we are closed and uh, meeting is adjourned. <laughs>